declare the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened into open session and that all council members are present. Our first item on the preliminary agenda is consideration and action resulting from the executive session. We have none. Our next item is the stuttering awareness presentation uh, by Landry Champlin, uh, Miss Plano 2021. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Landry Champlin, and I am Miss Plano 2020-2021. I am a preliminary title holder within the Miss Texas Miss America Scholarship Organization, and I'm so thankful to be here to speak to all of you today about my experience within the Miss America program, my job as Miss Plano, and my mission, the Live Fearless Foundation and the Live Fearless Message. Now, not many of, of people know that the that the Miss America organization is the largest provider of scholarships for women across the country. And in the state of Texas alone, we award over $100,000 of college scholarship funds to our title holders and candidates. And I'm very excited for the opportunity to compete for the job of Miss Texas at the end of June. But I'm even more thankful for the opportunity to have served as Miss Plano for the last two years. I was crowned Miss Plano on September 1st of 2019. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Miss Texas competition was canceled in 2020. So I was very fortunate to continue to serve as as Ms. Plano for the last two years. And to say it has been life-changing would be an understatement. Um, as y'all saw on the program, it was listed as a stuttering awareness presentation. And that was not an accident because I am a person who stutters. Um, and so my mission as Ms. Plano is to empower everyone I come in contact with to live fearlessly. Um, and this came about by my own experience living fearlessly as a person who stutters competing within the Miss Texas organization. Um, for those of you that may or may not know this program is heavily rooted in public speaking um, and so I started competing when I was 14 years old and prior to that experience I struggled to speak in front of my class I struggled to order my own food at a restaurant anything that had to do with public speaking I shied away from because of my speech impediment um, and so because of the Miss Texas organization and the opportunity I had to step outside of my comfort zone and live fearlessly myself I now am not only serving as Miss Plano with the mission to empower everyone to find that same fearlessness. But I have also published a children's book entitled Fiona the Fearless Fox, which is about a fox named Fiona, and she empowers her, her fearless friends to step outside of their comfort zone and recognize their unique talents, and she empowers them to become their most fearless, most confident versions of themselves. I am also the founder and president of the 501c3 nonprofit organization, the Live Fearless Foundation, and what we aim to do is exactly what my mission is as Ms. Plano. I want to work to inspire the students of Texas to become their most fearless versions of themselves by awarding them with scholarships so that they can take part in opportunities that empower them to do so. I am also the creator of an online platform called The Fearless Files. It is a blog podcast website where people can go and they can look and find the inspiration and the resources that they need to step outside of their comfort zone and pursue the passions that make them feel the most fearless. And most importantly, throughout my year as Miss Plano, I've had the opportunity to work with the city of Plano through Plano Arts and Visit Plano um, in an effort to empower our wonderful city to be the most fearless that it can be. So thank you all so much for having me. If you would like to learn more about my year as Miss Plano and the work that I'm doing to empower our great city to live fearlessly, you can head over to my website, www.missplanotx.com. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Landry. <laughs> Thank you, Landy. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for representing Plano like you did. Our next item, comprehensive monthly financial report for March 2021. Uh, Denise Tacky, Director of Finance. Good evening. I'm going to start sharing my screen with you. Yep. You're on mute. <clears throat> um. I'm not actually. We got her. Can you see my screen? Can can you hear me?
We have her up. Denise, keep talking. Or yeah, there you go. Go off. You're, now, you, now it shows you're on mute. <laughs> I feel your pain. Am I on? Can you hear me now? No, we still can't hear you, Denise. Um, I'll tell you what, why don't, uh, yes, uh, Mayor, why don't we uh, pivot to the next item and then see if Denise could come uh, downstairs and we could try this uh, after the encore item. Yeah, I'll come, I'll come down. Oh. Oh, whoa. There you were. Hold on. Oh. There you are. I was. Voila. Okay, I don't know. It was just. I don't know what was going on. Yes. <laughs> Can you see my screen, though? Yes. Okay. So this is the comprehensive monthly financial report for the month of March 2021. We do actually do this report on a monthly basis. However, I present to council on a quarterly basis. So you'll hear me comparing um, from the prior quarter, because that was the last presentation we had. So this first slide represents our revenues compared to budget by fund. The general fund has revenues of 217 million for the first half of the fiscal year. This represents 74.5% of the total annual budget. Um, the reason that's so high, it's not at 50% is because the majority of our ad valorem taxes are collected in December and January. So they're reflected in this first quarter. The water and sewer fund has 76 million in revenues and that represents 42.7% of the total annual budget. Again, the water and sewer revenues go up in the summer um, where generally people are watering more and it's warmer out. This slide represents our expenditures compared to budget by fund. The general fund has expenditures of 120.5 million for the first half of the fiscal year. That's 43.5% of the total annual budget. And the water and sewer fund has expenditures of 62.6 million, which represents 44.3% of the total annual budget. This slide actually represents our net change in fund balance for the past three years. In the general fund for the first half of the fiscal year, the fund balance has increased by 79.5 million. You can see that we're doing better in fiscal year 2021 than we have in the past two years. This is up because we began to collect our Apple Warm taxes again in the first half of the fiscal year, but also it's due to receipt of CARES funding. So we did receive some CARES funding last year and we received a second amount of CARES funding in the second quarter of the fiscal year. The water and sewer fund balance has decreased by 6.7 million. This is worse, this is the worst position than we were in at this time in the prior fiscal year, which had um, this fund at a $3.3 .3 million decrease. So um, trending a little bit worse at this point in time, but that's primarily due to the fact that we haven't been collecting late fees for the last year. We're just now starting that up again and starting to hang our blue tags on the doors and um, trying to get people on payment plans. So we should see that begin to improve. Um, the Environmental Waste Services Fund has decreased by 2 million and the Municipal Drainage Fund has decreased by 301,000. So this is our general fund revenues, um, actual compared to actual, and they're lower than the prior year by $4 million. There was an increase of property tax revenues by $4.8 million, and additionally sales tax revenue is down by $874,000. Um, but we did have a positive audit adjustment of $745,000 in the first six months. Other major decreases in our revenues include our court fines are being down, are down by $833,000. This has been something that we have seen throughout the pandemic as there were less people driving. Um, less traffic and delayed collections. Franchise fees are also down by 1.3 million. And the city overall has seen decreases in rec fees, athletic revenue, rec member fees, and city pool revenues. Whoops. Our general fund expenditures are lower than the prior year by 15.4 million. So our personnel costs decreased by 1.4 million. 
that was offset against a reimbursement against expenditures of 9.7 million that came in the form of the CARES funding. Um, public safety payroll costs are being substantially that are substantially dedicated to mitigating or responded to COVID-19 public health emergency were allowed to be reimbursed from these CARES expense. So that's primarily what helped us with this. Overall, we've seen decreases in expenditures as all departments. We haven't been spending as much on travel and training and everybody's just had a general tightening of budgets in this last fiscal year. Here we're looking at our health claims fund. We had an increase in our fund balance of about $1.5 million. This is mostly due to a decrease in expenses. As you know, not as many people are getting out and going to the doctor the first six months of this fiscal year. But we do have a healthy fund balance that is of about $22.9 million in this health claims fund. Unemployment rates in December were at 5.4%. We have seen them increase slightly in March to 5.5%. This is our more recent sales tax information. Um, the sales tax I talked about before was through the first six months. This, however, is for the month of May. We're down compared to the prior year by 0.87%, but this, this is a decrease of about 67,000 over the same period last year. However, there was a very large negative audit adjustment of $1.5 million. Otherwise, we would have begun to see the recovery in our sales tax numbers. So it's really unusual to have that large of a negative audit adjustment. We just happened to have it um, right as we were starting to recover. So our real estate market recap shows the number of days on the market was 33 days in December. That's compared to 27 days in March. So um, it's not that how homes aren't staying on the market as much as long. And then the percent of asking was at 99% in December compared to 102% in March. And as long as I have been giving this presentation, which has been quite some time now, I've, I've never seen it go over 100%. So the average selling price for a home in Plano was at 477,838 in December. This is now um, increased to 513,850 in March. And the price per square foot in December was 164, and it is now 177 in March. So we're seeing a substantial increase in the real estate market at this point in time. Our hotel occupancy tax is down by 2.2 million compared to the prior fiscal year. Again, this industry was hit particularly hard because of COVID. Hopefully we're starting to see some of that rebound back up, but this represents a 55.2% decrease over the prior year. This is our equity and treasury pool. It's basically our investment portfolio and how much of each investments are owned by each fund. The enterprise funds own 11% own of the equity um, that's going to be funds like water and sewer, municipal drainage, environmental waste services, the golf course. And then our largest share of equity is always in the capital projects fund. That's at 29%. So the capital projects funds are where our bond proceeds go into. And that also includes our capital maintenance funds. So we typically carry a significant amount of money in those. We'll also see this go up in the next quarter as we get our bond proceeds in. Um, with this coming sale, the proceeds will be received in June. And then um, the general fund has 22% of our equity. Our investment pool portfolio maturities shows that we're, um, we have it very much spread out um, to manage our cash better. Our portfolio has a book value of 500 or 660 million as it was 590 million as of December 31st, 2020. It's now gone up to 661 million as of March 31st. Again, that's just representative of collecting, you know, more funds and tightening the belt on the on expenditures. So we have we have a little more in the portfolio. And then this is our um, portfolio diversification. As we like to show this, just to show we're very diversified. Again, we have to follow the Public Funds Investment Act, so we're very conservative um, with how we invest. We can't invest in the stock market or any risky type um, investments. 
And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Denise. Any questions for Denise? Councilman Williams. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, I've heard anecdotally about what's happening in the housing market, uh, but I hadn't actually seen any figures until tonight. Um, any idea what's causing this, but more so what effect this might have on our upcoming budget year in terms of uh, uh, appraisals from the CAD? Well, in the, we're, we're actually looking at an increase in the appraisals from the CAD right at this point in time. Of course, there's the, you know, the COVID exemptions. We don't know how many people are going to apply for those or actually qualify for them. There has to be like a, well, not the COVID exemptions, but from the freeze, there has to be a 15% decline in value. But I think we're going to continue to see the property values rise. Part of it is that housing just isn't available. So um, the housing stock just isn't out there as we have so many companies moving here and um, people moving into the area. So a lot of it has to do with, with that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Our next item is the Encore update. Uh, Paul Hernandez, area manager for Encore, welcome. <clears throat> Good to see you here. I, I didn't know I was gonna have to follow Landry, so I apologize about that. <laughs> so uh, she's gonna queue up the presentation. Okay, so um, I wanted to come visit briefly about the uh, the winter event we had uh, this past February, and uh, this is a pretty short presentation. So if you have some questions, they may be answered, you know, in the following slides. So maybe we'll we'll take the questions at the end. So if that's okay. So some of the things we'll, we'll talk about is uh, our communication process and challenges and the rotating outages that we uh, uh, announced at the beginning of the event. Um, also about our critical load uh, customers and have an update for you on that with regard to Plano as well. And then also why some customers were not impacted. That's, I know, a lot of curiosity on that. So just a quick overview. Encore is part of the ERCOT, ERCOT market, and uh, we are a delivery company, a transmission and distribution uh, delivery utility. Uh, we basically measure electricity onto the grid from power plants, and uh, that could be wind or generation, you know, uh, typical uh, fossil fuel generation or solar. And we measure uh, electricity used by customers. Uh, again, we are the delivery company, and then you also have uh, the third leg on that stool is the retail electric providers who actually sell electricity to customers, and they buy uh, the electricity that they sell on the wholesale market. So, yeah. so uh, this is the interesting uh, part of the presentation. This kind of this shows you uh, basically the load shedding event that. Uh, that we faced uh, during during uh, the cold snap. Uh, <clears throat> there you'll see an arrow pointing to before uh, the load shedding began of how Encore had to pre-position equipment and materials and uh, personnel. Uh, we actually requested almost 2,400 off-system uh, full-time employees to come assist us in preparation for this event because you know we knew it was coming. We were uh, concerned about the possible ice and the things that might have on our delivery system. And so we, uh, we really ramped up our preparedness on this and we opened up our emergency center as well. Then you can kind of see as we move forward, uh, this was uh, Sunday night into Monday morning uh, where the load shedding event uh, began. And uh, the blue uh, columns represent the total load shed of the ERCOT system. Uh, of course, this uh, this storm did cover almost all of Texas, so it did affect the entire ERCOT system, not just North Texas. 
And then the red line represents uh, Encore's uh, load shedding uh, requirements uh, by ERCOT. So uh, just keep in mind, Encore is about 36% of the ERCOT system with regard to load, so we're a pretty heavy part of it. Uh, <clears throat> there you see in the early morning, uh, starting at 145, I'll just say briefly that uh, we were asked to begin shedding load, and uh, so we made a, a very quick announcement about that, uh, that load shedding and also that it would be rotating outages. Uh, and <clears throat> then, uh, then, of course, what happens is uh, just, you know, several minutes after that, we're asked to shed almost 10 times the amount of load that was initially asked. When, when we got to that point, it really became difficult to do any type of rotating outages, and we went to a controlled outage system. So, and I'll address more of that in the uh, next slide. So, uh, that mentions there that, you know, at the peak, uh, 20,000 megawatts were, were shed, uh, which was about five times larger than the 2011, for those who were, who were here, the 2011 event. So, uh, just something, I'm a 36-year employee next month, and uh, never faced an event uh, quite like this one. Uh, so, Encore, ultimately, we had to shed uh, 7,200 megawatts of load. Uh, you may ask, well, megawatt serves somewhere between six and 700 homes. So just to kind of give you some scale. Uh, affected 1.3 million customers of our customers. And uh, it was just the, the load shedding was just necessary to keep the grid stable. Uh, if <clears throat> that, that was our number one priority, if we don't keep the grid stable, if we don't keep the grid up, you know, uh, this becomes even though there is a lot of concern and fallout and hardship and even death that, that uh, the ERCOT system faced, if we, if we, if we have a full-blown blackout, uh, we would still be recovering from that as well. Uh, it, it, instead of recovery and, you know, mostly we recovered it within the week. We still had some customers that needed to be addressed beyond that, but a full-blown blackout would have caused us, to, you know, weeks and months to get the, the electric system back on. So the number one priority that ERCOT and Encore had to address was making sure we did not go to a full blackout. And as I mentioned before, just the sheer magnitude of the requirement of the load shedding uh, really prevented us from any rotating outages uh, we were protecting hospitals, and, and as far as I know, we did not have a hospital in Plano or Cone County out, which was a good thing. And that was one of the lessons uh, that from 2011 that, that was brought to our attention. But uh, we, we did have a lot of facilities that were out, but at no choice. I mean, I, I, again, in my 30, almost 36 years, I've never had to, to pick up the phone and say, I can't get your electricity on right now until we've got generation back up. And at that time, we did not, so. Okay. So the generation could not support the load on the system. Uh, we take our direction from ERCOT on load shedding, uh, we, you know, to, to keep stability of the grid. And we do have a pre-planned process. Uh, we, we follow a plan on the load shedding event and all, all that was followed. So, uh, Again, it, it mentions here on the emergency side that uh, with the with the grid with as much generation as we lost in the grid as it was, it was virtually impossible to rotate outages. You're trying to keep everything stable. If you if you rotate outages during the the massive amount of load shit that we were under, you come come in danger of losing other load and losing even more of your customers. So. That is kind of the reason, well, that is the reason why uh, several of our customers had long extended outages for, you know, a day, several days, three days. Uh, we just could not uh, get those rotated. As the system stabilized more, as some generation returned, 
we were able to begin some rotation, even though it wouldn't be every 45 minutes, maybe it was every two or three hours that did start returning uh, somewhat through the, the event itself. So what we're looking at here is the, uh, the industry on how we're gonna handle responding to these load shed events of this magnitude. Again, I think this is probably a 30 year event, you know, so that there's a lot of decisions to be made on, on the entire market itself. But uh, we're gonna continue to work with the gas industry uh, to make sure that their, uh, being, uh, their, their accounts and those things are not, the, this load shedding is not an impediment to keeping their services on. Uh, and also a better understanding of what our city's needs are. Uh, right now, I'm actually participating on an internal committee to address outreach and to make sure that we have accurate information, it's not outdated, uh, and also how to sustain that going forward. Uh, one thing, of course, uh, you know, Plano staff is always ahead of the curve. I actually started working with staff uh, shortly after this event to review their accounts, and that's before I think we even started could get a handle on it. And we've done that. I was able to provide all that information to the city and they have uh, already actually replied uh, with uh, new accounts that they want on the system. I will say that uh, this is something that we're going to take and uh, the accounts are viewed as public safety accounts with regard to you know police, 911 centers, water, those sorts of things. Uh, we did add a substantial, I would say it increased, uh, we probably more than double the, uh, the current list we had, so that was a good update that, that we were able to get. Uh, so that's something that we're, we're working on as well. Uh, Encores, we're also working on developing. Uh, we, we have a ton of data that we're, we analyze and we're trying to see how we can leverage that to minimize the uh, future load shed events and uh, better communication. I know this was one of uh, concerns. We were on a call uh, shortly after the storm. Uh, I think uh, Mark Ezerson for setting, requesting that and us having, being able to talk through some of those concerns. Um, it, it, at the time, it, it was, a, a, again, an unprecedented event. Um, and it wasn't that, you know, our top management wouldn't tell me what's going on. No, they did not know when we would be able to see generation back. So it was something that Encore had to follow direction from ERCOT because the generation kept falling off and we had to keep uh, shedding loads. So just a, a very difficult circumstance. Uh, we are working on better communication efforts though to try to communicate to customers what we're facing, what the possibilities are, and of course, we know the cold snap was a long sustained, at least 70 hours, uh, several days there. So, And then uh, another concern through the, uh, the whole event was uh, there, there were folks say, why is downtown Dallas lit up like a Christmas tree and other areas like that? So, you know, uh, communication on, uh, to customers to conserve through those type of events, that's, that's something that, that's coming as well. So... Um, that's that's kind of it. Um, I wanted to leave some time for for questions if you had if you had some for me. So oh. you explained how um, why you couldn't do the rotating out outages, right? But I think um, there was a lot of confusion by people about how you went about choosing, you know, which neighborhoods stayed on and which neighborhood stayed off. And, you know, I think there was a lot of people who thought, well, if I'm near a hospital or if I'm near a fire station, but then we had fire stations that, you know, lost power too. So can you go into a little bit more detail about how that works, about why, you know, somebody on one side of the street may have not had power for days and their neighbors across the street had it, yeah. you know, the whole time? Sure, that's a great question. And, and I spoke briefly to uh, Councilman Richard Daly uh, on this, you know, actually during the storm, but it's a very good question. Uh, we have a, a, a plan to, on our load shedding program, uh, but we also have a safety net 
and I'll, I'll go into that in just a minute. But the, uh, we have a cross the system, uh, across neighborhoods, across cities, counties. Uh, our, our system was very equitable uh, to, to load shed. Now, <clears throat> back to that, uh, where, why folks didn't go out. And I, I will say, you know, my home did not go out and I was grateful because so, I was able to help other people and try to get uh, some questions answered. But um, we have a safety net uh, on our system. These, uh, <clears throat> there are special relays at our substations. Uh, let, let's set the winter storm aside for just a moment. Uh, on a blue sky day, uh, maybe even a nice spring day, there might be a lot of generation uh, offline for maintenance and fueling or whatever they need to do in the system. But, you know, the, they look at weather forecasts and things like that to, to prepare daily uh, for load on the ERCOT system. Uh, but if you have a, an event where one or two or more uh, generation plants trip offline, we, we need to take humans out of the equation uh, to protect the grid. So our, we have about 40% of our system is covered with uh, special relays. They're called under frequency relays. And they will operate automatically if there is an under frequency event that happens. That my, <clears throat> and those, those are spread out throughout our company. I just happened to be on one. I think Rick Adeli was on one. Uh, and there were some folks. Now there were other feeders identified with hospitals, 911 centers. We purposely kept those on as we could. Now that doesn't mean they weren't subject to shedding because everybody was subject to shedding because of this event, if it had gotten worse or if we'd lost more generation. Uh, and that will also go, uh, I wanna also say with those accounts, the safety, public safety accounts that I mentioned earlier, those are not, we, we do want them identified, we wanna put them in our plan, but they're not exempt from being uh, shed in an emergency event. So that's, that's our safety net. Those feeders had to be kept on through the system because if another power plant or two tripped out, again, we had to take the humans out of the equation and the system has to react automatically to avoid any blackout. So those special relays, which are around 40% of our system, uh, have to be available to react to some sort of uh, loss of more generation, uh, and that had to be that has to be available every day. But especially during the winter event, we were more susceptible to possibly e losing even more generation. So, if you understand me, it's a, just an automatic, quick thing that those relays have to react to, and that's why those folks did not lose power because they happen to be on a under frequency relay feeder. Now, I will say. It's not a great advantage to be on an under frequency relay feeder because if something happens, you're the first one out. But in this case, you stayed on because we had to have the ability for the system to react automatically, if you follow me. So that's a great question. Maria. Mr. Hernandez, um, I, I don't envy you in standing there and having to answer our questions <laughs> about Encore and ERCOT, but I, I do want to um, ask you a question after I give a little comment. Um, my husband passed away two days before the winter storm and it was through um, terminal cancer and he could not be without heat. And I guess it was a blessing in disguise that he passed before our lights and electricity all went out for three days. I, every time I think about this, it traumatized me because um, I keep thinking, what if the electricity went out and I can't keep him warm. So my question to you is, we have Amber Alerts. We have um, ways that we use cell phone communication or um, emergency situations where we could communicate with our residents um, and tell them that there are certain emergencies that's beyond our control. So why is it at this point, those type of emergency and um, communications are not set up to communicate with our resident, to let them know um, that some type of a, a shutdown or, a, um, you know, a, um, I guess a release of load, that's, I guess that's the way you put it, mm -hmm. 
is not communicated to the residents so that they could prepare. You know, it's not so bad to be out of um, electricity if we know. I think transparency is what most people are really angry about. Um, had we known, we could make plans. And, you know, if had I known, I probably would have tried to get my husband into a hotel earlier or try to get him into a hospital. But because we don't have that information, that causes a lot more distress and a lot more stress and probably more anger from our residents. So is there something at this point Instead of saying, well, this is a 30 or 50 year event, it's probably never gonna happen again. Are we now prepared? Are we now prepared to be transparent so that we can let our residents know how to prepare for disasters such as this? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, I do wanna emphasize that Encore does not operate or own any generation. Uh, we're, we're just a delivery company. So with the loss of generation, uh, that's what required Encore to uh, shed load. Okay, I just want to be clear on that part. Uh, Encore did uh, a lot of uh, communication. We, we do have uh, apps and a communication system, but I will say it was overwhelmed. Uh, in all of 2020, uh, I forget the exact figure, but we received about two, two and a half million calls to our center. Just in the week of the, the winter storm event, uh, we received over three million uh, just in those uh, four or five days. And uh, that, that system was overwhelmed. Our, our, the telecommunications company that is probably the largest in the world was systems were overwhelmed. So, and they kind of went through a a, a communication shedding type event as well. So uh, there was uh, communication with regard to what our actions will be, but is there room for improvement? Absolutely. Uh, is there something more that we can do to better prepare our cup customers? Absolutely. And that is something we are striving and working on and have been working on since the event. So uh, more to come on that. So what are some of the solutions have you come up with? Uh, things that we are working on is like hardening the, uh, the communications system. Uh, you know, we, we do have an app that, that pushes information to customers. Uh, hopefully, you know, more will participate with that as well. Uh, but we, we have an immense amount of data. We're also looking at uh, is there different ways uh, to communicate? Uh, and uh, be, as you say, be more transparent with our, with our customers. It, it's something that is a, a work in progress that, you know, we're, we, have, we were going to have to report to our cities and to our regulators uh, on, on those actions and improvements that are there yet to come. So thank you for your question. Councilwoman Bell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question. You know, the your algorithms, right? Your algorithms that determines uh, when and how and where to shed the load. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a map that you can publish so that people can see? Yeah, we, we do have an outage map online for normal outages. Uh, but as far as the, the plan itself on where to shed and things like that, that's that's all proprietary information. It's <laughs> it, and and that's that's a it's, we have a dynamic system. It's going to change from uh, month to month, from year to year. Uh, on where those uh, different feeders are. Uh, of course, you know, there's new facilities being built all the time. I've got uh, a list of over 30 facilities in Plano that we need to add to that uh, public safety uh, list. And so uh, with the dynamic system in place, uh, it, it's, it's something that we're going, we have, uh, uh, you know, we, we are dedicated to, to fixing and to make, making sure we're being transparent and making sure that we have everything documented. But as far as uh, uh, where the feeders are and things like that, that's, uh, again, it, it's a plan that we have in place, but it's not public information. And for security reasons, there's a lot of our mapping systems that are not available to even the cities because you're, uh, you know, open records, it's, it's for security. 
Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Paul, kind of a follow-up. Uh, Councilmember Bow touched on something I was thinking about. I recognize the, the proprietary aspects of, of what you're talking about, but would there be a way, because you do have the app and everything else, that when something potentially was coming, that to, to blast out to notify the, the customers that, that that you know that are potentially going to be effective, not not just like an hour or so, but but could be like all for several, several hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I think that's important because I take my house, for example, you know, we were without power for about 30 hours. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But uh, initially, we didn't, we really didn't know how long it was going to last. So uh, like, you know, council member two had said, you know, is had, had we, had someone on life support or just that really needed uh, to have power, we would have not known that. And so we might have stayed and stay and been there longer. And then it may have been too late to, to make an arrangement. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be good if, if they uh, customers could be notified that potentially hey, your, this is coming in and your power goes off, be advised it may be a while. It may not be just one of these where it goes off and it's off for 20 or 30 minutes. So I think just something like that, I don't know if that would give away any proprietary natures, but if you could do some type of, of a uh, broadcast like that to the customers, because you, you have to know the people who are on these special relays to at least let them know that if something goes and the power goes off, potentially it's, it's not going to come back on in you know in 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, the Encore grid, the Encore system was ready to serve customers. I explained all the uh, you know, pre preparations we made, the manpower we brought in from out of state. Uh, this was a, a generation issue. I mean, when we're told to shed, we have to shed. So uh, they didn't see it coming, you know, we, definitely didn't see it coming where the, we would lose the amount of generation that we had to lose. I wholeheartedly agree with you on the communication aspect of it. Uh, that's something that, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at very, very, very closely and uh, hopefully, you know, we won't have a future event, but if that does happen, you know, of ways we're going to need to communicate and what we communicate at the time. Uh, you know, we we have <clears throat> meteorologists now on our, our, our on our system, so it's something. If we knew uh, that, I, I mean, we just didn't know we were going to lose that generation. So uh, it's 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 so difficult to to say, you know, that we weren't prepared, but we were. But the communication aspect could have been better, and I, I agree with you uh, for folks to make plans and things like that. We did not know when the generation would come back so we could turn folks back on. We, we, we just didn't know. And I was, we were all up around the clock waiting for more generation to come online so I could make calls and say, your power should be on in the next several hours or whatnot. And that's just something we, we could not do. Again, could not control. So. Let, let me ask you a little bit different way here. It may, you, you may have, have answered. So. <laughs> Would we, could we reasonably assume that, uh, like my residents and my neighbors, whatever, that, that were affected for hours and hours and hours during, during this shutdown and, and understanding it was a, you know, 100 year you know, event, would it be prudent to assume that something like this potentially coming again, those of us who did go through hours and hours and hours without power? reasonably might expect that same thing could happen again because I, I would guess that we are probably on one of those relay type, you know, switching things that that will shut down, you know, in the event of an emergency. So would that be a, a good assumption that if, if we experienced an inordinate length of time without power this time, that in the future we might want to think about making other arrangements? Uh, you know, I would say definitely uh – Two, two points. Our messaging is going to be different. It will be improved. It'll, you know, it's going to take the side of caution and, and ask our customers to prepare. But again, I mentioned earlier, we have a dynamic system. So what affected, you know, this last February may not even be uh, the same thing in the fall because every, every spring we're, we're making adjustments 
fortifications improvements to our system uh, for load growth and, and uh, also for you know maintenance for reliability. And we're, <clears throat> our grid is becoming more and more automated each year. And so uh, load gets moved around. So things, it's a very dynamic system. You may not even be on the same feeder this next fall that you were on this spring. So uh, that's really more true kind of up in our area. Uh, but even in Dallas where there's a lot of redevelopment things, you know, again, it's a dynamic system. So uh, I, I see your point on that, but the next time around, you may be on a different system, a different part of the feeder, a different part of the substation or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually may be a different situation. It's not, it's not a system where, okay, this happened to me last February, you know, in three years, if we had another event, same thing should happen. No, no, it'll, it'll, it'll be different. So the system will be different. Okay. Thanks for the update, Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilman Gray. Mr. Hannes, thank you very much for being here. Um, I wanted to add a couple of notes as you get into your committee on communications um, to see if I can't provide you uh, some information that may help. I sit on the North Central Texas Council of Governments, which is 16 counties, and I chair the Emergency Planning Preparedness Council. And interconnected into that is all the EOCs in that 16 county area. We had a discussion on this last week. Many of them were unprepared and unaware um, of what was going to take place. And I think that what might help in the future is if your team and ERCOT's team gets together with the Council of Governments that are really all over the state of Texas, but primarily the one I'm interested in, which is North Central, um, and work with the emergency planning preparedness team that's there to put into the plans what they need to do um, and all of the emergency steps that they need to take so we can communicate out to our county officials and to our city officials. I say that because um, we've become a nation that is way too reliant on a mobile phone. And um, I was on the team when I came into the Gulf Coast and removed a lot of the infrastructure. Um, we said that would never happen again. Katrina and Rita proved us wrong. Um, it happened worse. And um, what we saw, and certainly since 9-11, much of this grid is, is not mapped for a for specific reason, and that is because terrorists also know that if you take out the infrastructure, you take out everything. We knew that in the military. Take out communications, take out infrastructure, everything goes away. Mm -hmm. So sending messages to cell phones only work if cell towers are lit and have electricity and operate. If you take out a, a significant grid, you take out cell phone towers. If you don't have cell phone towers, cell phones don't work. Um, we found that in some cases you can send text messages, but you cannot send audio messages because of the bandwidth that's necessary to push a text message to a, to a, a, a vocal message. So all of those types of things need to be considered and should be part of the communications plan um, when, when people have these incidences. The other thing that I would say, and one that I discovered, because like Councilmember Smith, I was out from Monday through Thursday, and, and I knew what to do, so I was okay. Um, but the thing that I noticed every once in a while on the cell phone while it was charged, and by the way, I had a solar-powered cell, <laughs> cell charger, <phone> charger. <laughs> so I was able to keep my phone operating, is it would say, if you're having an issue go to the website. But if your power is down, your computer doesn't come up, you can't get to the website. Right. And so really what it, it does for me is it just adds fuel onto, you know, I'm trying to get an answer. I can't get an answer because nothing's working. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to go back to some of the basics. I, and I don't mean all the way back to smoke signals, but it's <laughs> almost there. Um, we, we become way too reliant on technology and we can take it out in a moment and nothing works. So my, my encouragement to your communications team is to work with um, the emergency planning preparedness councils that are in are located within the, the COGS throughout the state of Texas so that we can respond to some of those things because sometimes it simply means 
I can't call someone. I've got to go to them, and, and we, we need basically a vocal chain. I'm going to go and see 10 people. They're going to go and see 10 people. It may have to get to that if, it, if it's out for a duration of time. This was, this was a significant duration of time, but not a significant time like we had on the Gulf Coast, where it was months getting cell towers and power towers back up in the air. So I thank you very much um, for coming here and making the presentation, talking with us. Um, hopefully this is helpful to you as well. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councilman Grady. Councilman. Please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I mean, my understanding is that um, <clears throat> there was every intention of going to 45-minute rolling blackouts, and it just didn't materialize. And I'm not sure how much uh, Encore is equipped to do about it, but I did want to ask about the possibility of uh, activating uh, city or regional emergency alert systems that if something like this doesn't even have to do with electricity, but we expect things are going to go one way, they go really south, uh, that we can get an alert out. In this case, it could have been simply uh, rolling blackouts aren't necessarily going to emerge. Be prepared for an extended outage, ETA unavailable. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Paul, for that presentation. Thank you also for, as you mentioned, uh, being available to answer questions during the storm. Uh, that was very helpful and helped me to get word out to, to some of our residents, uh, which I, I think uh, helped our, our community. But uh, as you mentioned, um, I, I, my family was very blessed that we, we did not lose power. Uh, that, that enabled us to take in my mother-in-law and brothers-in-law who, who did lose power. But many, uh, you know, ma many people we know and many people in our community uh, did lose power and, and uh, were, were without it uh, for substantial periods of time. Uh, you know, sometimes causing loss of life and, you know, in every case, causing great hardship. Um, you mentioned the lessons learned from 2011 about hospitals. And I know you've received many suggestions, so I won't belabor the point. But uh, just to add my voice to the chorus, uh, if uh, there's any way that the grid could prioritize maintaining power to a network of warming stations, uh, that way people who are displaced due to loss of power have some place to go. I remember during the storm, the city was was ready to uh, uh, operate a warming station at the Plano Event Center, but but the Event Center lost power. Uh, fortunately, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince's church and uh, Council Member Bow's church and other other uh, uh, other institutions in the community were able to to step up and uh, and help. But I think uh, if there was a plan ahead of time for, you know, these are these are things that are going to be treated like hospitals. These are going to be warming stations that in when, if the worst happens again, you know, the, the, these would not lose power. Is, is that something Encore might be able to work on so that displaced persons have a place to go? So you, you bring up a great point. So I mentioned earlier that 40% of our feeders are on that last safety net that we have to maintain up. So, and then now you got to look at, all the hospitals and 911 centers and water and all those sorts of things that must also stay on. So we're, we're down to about 60% of what we have or that we need to shed between. And we have all these uh, facilities and all these customers that are critical public safety that we've got to keep on. So now our, uh, our choice of uh, rotation has become, you know, even smaller. So you can kind of see the challenges that we, we face when uh, an, an event like this, your, your choices become smaller and smaller. And then with the sheer uh, growth, of, I mean, how much power we had to shed, uh, you know, ro rotating out just, just became impossible. It, they really did. So, but uh, to your point, I, I, I understand. Uh, fortunately, the feeder that serves Grace Church was uh, actually uh, recently worked on uh, for some other outage issues. And, uh, and then by coincidence was also on an under frequency relay at, at that certain time. So uh, I remember talking to Mr. Israelson, you know, late at night and, and working on these issues, but, uh, and going, you know, up line, but we just couldn't commit because of that shortage of who, who can we rotate? Who can, you know, we've got to keep these on and we've got to keep the safety net up uh, that we just couldn't commit at the time to, to uh, keeping one particular feeder on for a or warming center. It just, 
It just wasn't possible at the time, just because of the sheer massive amount of load that we did have to. And again, affected 1.3 million customers. So uh, one thing we could not allow to happen was for the for a blackout to occur. So uh, those are being looked at. That's being looked at. Uh, I, we've heard the, the concern about, you know, if we can identify a location, a warming center, things like that. And I, I will say the city has also submitted some uh, accounts on that safety, uh, public safety, that I, I'm pretty sure that's the intention. So that's something that we're looking at. Well, thank you for looking into that, Paul, and thank you for the information. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Mayor and Council, I just wanted to take a, a moment to, uh, first of all, thank Paul for, for coming out. This shows the, the nature of our partnership and relationship in the community that, um, you know, it was a tough week. And these, and uh, I know Encore has, has stood firm in answering some tough questions from throughout the community and throughout the region. And, and we're committed to being a good partner and working with them uh, on solutions that will help our community as we go forward and if we face something like this in the future. So uh, I appreciate the, the comments and the feedback on communications. Obviously, that was a, a critical piece of this. And I will share with you all that I did call Paul uh, 24 hours a day uh, and he always picked up. So that was uh, that shows the strength of our relationship. And when he did not have answers, he shared, frankly, that, uh, you know, he was um, sharing everything that he had information on. It's not what he could share. He shared everything he had. Uh, at that time, which for us was was very valuable um, and helped us uh, to communicate what we could and what we had uh, to our citizens. But we appreciate Paul's willingness to be a, a strong partner as, as Encore is, and uh, we stand ready to be a good partner in helping find solutions uh, as we move forward. So just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Han Hernandez. We appreciate it very much for the information. Thank you. Our next item is uh, consent and regular agendas. Uh, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. If I may, I'd, I'd like to pull uh, item T, the Collin Creek uh, uh, final project plan uh, off of the consent agenda for proposed modification. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right. Uh, any items for uh, future agendas? Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, I, I think we may have discussed this before, but I don't either like an update or just hear about solutions for um, a safer crossing at 14th Street, um, right um, from the parking lots by um, Urban Rio and across. I've noticed several times crossing there that it just... Um, I think there's potential for a safety issue, not just for pedestrians, but also for cars. It's just a challenging crossing there. I'll get with Jack Carr in our engineering group and we will uh, bring back a, a report. Thank you. And anything else? Okay, we will take a recess and return at uh, 720 for the regular meeting. Thank you.
I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We will begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Mayor Pro Tem Casey Prince and the Pledge of Allegiance and the Texas Pledge led by Council Member Rick Grady. Would you all please rise? Father God, we thank you that um, your word says that in every situation you're with us. And so right now I ask you to um, grant peace to every one of our citizens who may be struggling. And I thank you that you are with us tonight. I thank you that you're with this council, helping us to work well together, um, to listen well to our citizens, and to make good choices for the future of our city. I thank you for the safety of everyone in our community. And I thank you for health, and I thank you for bringing good things to every one of us in our city. In your name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please repeat with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Be seated. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Prince, and thank you, Councilman Grady, for leading the pledge and the prayer. We have a certificate of appreciation, uh, Community Relations Commission, Lada Shridharan. Plano's fortunate to have citizens who are glad to volunteer and support the boards and commissions of our city. We thank you all for your time, efforts, and willingness to serve. Thank you very much. Next item is comments of public interest. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speed speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items, but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And we do have a few speakers this evening. The first one is John Heyer. All those uh, with public comments, uh, please state your name and address. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is John Heyer. I live at 9620 Gold Hills Drive. I thank you for the time to, for the citizens to address you. Uh, I'll start by saying I support anyone's rights to peacefully and legally protest. In Plano, as I understand it, you need a special needs permit and you can't violate Texas Penal Code 4201 and block roads while protesting. I'm here asking for reassurance that we still have a safe city. I'd like to go back to May 2nd. Approximately 1.2 million have seen the two minute video. Only a handful of those 1.2 million have seen Officer Tilly's report and or heard city manager who's read the report. Of those, I would argue in large part, plain of citizens still wonder, for those that don't know, didn't hear the report about the gun or taser, wonder why the protesters were allowed to block the road. Lastly, why the police officer didn't do anything to clear the road. What they've all heard is nothing, and they're left to assume they're out to fend for themselves. And they're not safe, and this could be the next Portland. The question is this, when is someone here going to address the city of Plano? From what we've seen last year, I'll give you two scenarios, and I hate to be dramatic, but let's assume any one of us are in that next scenario. It's late July. It's Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. And because they didn't see the video, citizens get up to remove their protesters. And they'll go across the street, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, and they throw something, they paint something, and they start something on fire. Will that be something that we can tell the plaintiff citizens? What if the next time, in that same scenario, that gun or taser gets mistaken for a gun and shots are fired? Then what? Will we say something then? I ask someone to have the courage to step before citizens of Plano and please give us reassurance we still have a safe city. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Steve Johnson.
Yes, my name is uh, Steve Johnson, and I live at uh, 7901 Windrose Towers, which is just north of the Legacy West development. Um, I've been a resident of Plano for 36 years, and I'm pleased to say I've never had to come over here to file a complaint, but uh, maybe after 36 years it was time. My complaint deals with the current noise ordinance, and it's not a complaint with the ordinance itself. Instead, it's a complaint with how the ordinance is being enforced. Let me explain. In September of last year, I, mo I moved from my house on the west side of Plano to a high-rise condo, uh, the address that I gave you before, which is just north of the Legacy West development. About one half uh, block south of Windrose Tower is Legacy Hall, which you may be aware includes an outdoor music area. On Friday and Saturday nights, uh, live music concerts are performed at this hall, and the current noise ordinance specifies the maximum decibel level, and Legacy Hall has been cited and fined on several, several occasions for exceeding that maximum limit. Now, since, since September, when I moved in and started to experience this, um, whenever the noise level did exceed the, uh, and I had a decibel reader, I could tell, whenever the noise le level was over the top, I would simply call the local police officer who had been assigned to this because it's an ongoing issue. And literally within minutes, he would be, he would come to my 14th floor condo. He would take his decibel reader out. He would measure. And if he confirmed that the decibel level exceeded the maximum level, he would simply go down to, to the, uh, and speak to the people at Legacy Hall and tell them to tone it down. And generally they would. So now while there was an occasional annoyance from time to time, at least I had a way to enforce the ordinance. That is until April, about a month and a half ago. In April, I was actually contacted by the officer that has been working this for like six months. And he texted me and he said, you know, will you call the Plano Environmental Group? There's a gentleman that wants to speak with you. So I said, sure. What I learned from that gentleman turned this issue totally upside down. Because what I was told, first of all, was that the environmental group is in charge of enforcing the noise ordinance. And if, ever, if I ever had a problem with it, I had to call this gentleman at the Plano environmental group. And I quickly asked him, I said, gee, so on Friday night at nine o'clock, Saturday night at 9.30, if, you know, if the strobe lights are coming up into my condo and the walls are bouncing around, I'm supposed to call you? Are, are you on duty on Friday and Saturday nights? Well, no, he acknowledged that, that he was wrap it up. Your time's up, so go ahead and finish. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, worse, worst of all, sorry, worse was that he told me that any measurement going forward had to be done from the first floor of Windrose Tower. No one lives on the first floor of Windrose Tower. That The first floor is the parking garage. There's a five-story building between Legacy Hall and Windrose Tower. I'm sure that if I had a freestanding house, that I would have the right to have the measurement from my personal house. I have a condo on the 14th floor. Why don't I have the right to be measured from there? And so I was told that the, that, and I, and I know the ordinance is to be enforced by the city manager. There's no rule that says the first floor in the ordinance. So I'm appealing to the city manager to reconsider this. And if he doesn't, I've been told that my other alternative is to try to get it on the agenda of the, of, of the council. So sorry Thank for taking No, no, time. no, I appreciate it. Thank you. The next speaker is Uh, Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Jerry Kendrick. I live at 7901 Windrose. And uh, I'm here to talk about a chronic problem of loud cars and motorcycles in the vicinity of Windrose and headquarters, uh, communications and headquarters. Last Thursday on the 20th, uh, about 30 residents of the Windrose Towers met with uh, Gail Laco, uh, the police legal advisor, uh, Lieutenant Rude and Sergeant Ewell, 
Uh, and I want you to know that we're very grateful for their professionalism and willingness to work with us. And, and we were very appreciative that, uh, that they uh, were concerned with their issues. It appears that the major factor in this issue is the city does not take enforcement action against loud noise violations. We were told that since the first of the year, a total of two citations, count them, two had been issued for this violation. That level of inactivity is not likely to change anybody's behavior very much. Moreover, we learned that the city's position is that a violation doesn't occur unless the operator of the vehicle intentionally revs the engine to make the noise. This is a much more stringent standard and appears to be a self-inflicted injury than the Texas Transportation Code that requires only that a motor vehicle be equipped with a muffler in good working condition that continually operates to prevent unusual or excessive noise. I might add that I live on the sixth floor of the Windrose Tower and vehicles 100 yards away coming through double pane glass and over my television are clearly audible and disturbing. That's excessive or unusual. Also, a person is prohibited from using a muffler, cutout, bypass, or similar device on a motor vehicle. Both Ford and Chrysler offer an optional package that you have to pay for to make noise using active valve, seconds. which uses a flapper valve to open up the exhaust when the driver accelerates, and it can be tuned to be quiet or loud. Therefore, the operator is making a conscious decision to operate a vehicle that produces excessive or unusual noise. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this issue and, and I look forward to seeing an improvement in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The next speaker is Beverly Rogers. Thank you. Uh, Beverly Rogers, 7728 Alderwood Place. Um, thank you, council members, for granting me the time to appear before you this evening. I'm here to actually follow up on an email that I sent to each of you last week and really encourage you to take the time and consider adopting a city ordinance that regulates the installation and use of outdoor residential lighting. The letter I sent last week was in regards to a client that I represent as an attorney. My client is also a longtime resident of Plano and for the last two years has endured a light pollution issue. The neighbors across the street have installed very bright outdoor lighting that points directly at my client's home and shines from one end of the house through to the other. My client has tried approaching the issue in a very neighborly manner by going over to the neighbors, knocking on the door. Um, she's written five letters just asking that they meet and resolve the issue and has never received a response. So when she came to our firm and asked for assistance, we advised we'd start with cease and desist letters um, and we did send two and also managed to get the neighbor on the phone. We hoped that after the phone call and the two letters that we would resolve the issue. However, as of this weekend, the issue still exists. Um, we even reached out to the city for help because Plano does already have an effective outdoor lighting ordinance. Under Article 6, Section 6-470B, there is limitations on how lighting can be illuminated onto a neighbor's property. However, residential um, properties are excluded from that ordinance. It only covers commercial properties. Almost every municipality that surrounds Plano has an outdoor lighting ordinance for both residential and commercial properties. So we are asking that you seriously consider the negative impact that light pollution can have on you and your neighbors and that we eliminate um, not the ability to protect our own property, but that we have properly installed residential outdoor floodlights that are pointed onto our own properties and not through the neighbor's windows. And I believe that your actions today can prevent future lawsuits, and it's always beneficial for all citizens when their own city provides relief from problems such as these. So I thank you again for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. The next speaker, Scott Linden. Good evening, my name is Scott Linden. I'm at uh, 3905 Bandera Drive in East Plano. And I wanted to uh, bring to your attention an issue in regards to the Rowlett Creek Regional Sewage Treatment Plant. This does not have anything to do with the zoning case. So if you would, uh, it has to do with 
uh, the capacity of the treatment plant. And um, I just wanted to, um, this information has come from the district in, in several meetings, and I just wanted to uh, bring it to your attention, kind of like the Encore guy, as far as the uh, uh, shedding of load. The, um, the, the district has said that there's 25 million gallons a day average daily flow coming into the treatment plant, but there's not capacity to treat that. Uh, presently, it's, it's handled by bypassing to Wilson Creek through a single force main. That single force main is about 40 years old. It's been identified as a single point of failure, yet it's uh, going to continue to be used for the next 30 years. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention as something to look at. If that fails, and this was uh, from a Hazen and Sawyer report that they um, uh, identified that if that uh, force main failed, there would not be capacity at the treatment plant enough to meet the permit. So it's, it's, it's an issue, and it was also used to justify the, the present uh, expansion, which is only a peak flow expansion. Nothing's being done on the average flow. So when additional developments are being approved, this goes towards that average capacity, and uh, already you're exceeding your average capacity if you don't take into account that uh, single failure force main. And I wanted to thank you, Mark, for keeping the power going at the treatment plant. Uh, kudos to you for, for doing that, uh, because that would have been a real problem if, if there was an overflow at that uh, treatment plant site. Thank, thank you. you. That was the last speaker for public comments. Thank you. Let's move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda. <clears throat> the consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from the agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Thank you. Is there a motion for the remainder of the consent agenda as recommended with the exception, exception of item T? Motion to approve. Second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item T. Please vote. <clears throat> Motion passes eight to zero. <clears throat> Item T, consider approval of the project and financing plan for the tax increment financing reinvestment zone number four, making certain findings, providing a severability clause and providing for immediate effective date. Good evening, Peter Brasser with the um, special projects um, for this. Let, let me uh, call up my presentation really quickly. Um, we're doing this new since we haven't done this in a year or so. Okay, uh, let's see if I can get rid of that. Okay, so um, item T is the um, approval of the project and financing plan for TERS number four. TERS number four is um, having to do with the Collin Creek Redevelopment Project and the area surrounding it. Um, I have a, a couple of slides just as a refresher because I think the last time we talked about TERS number four was in January of 2020. Um, and uh, so, again, the mall of project, of course, is these 99... Are we not showing it? Or is it just lagging behind? Sorry. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, now we're in sync. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the 99 acres, of course, is the mall itself, but the, the zone is uh, quite larger than that. Uh, the two major projects that the tourist does fund are two uh, parking garages within the mall. Um, those are shown here on the screen in the yellow dash. So this one on the east side, um, which is the rather larger one, about 2,000 spaces, and one on the south side. The one on the east side has uh, structures above it and will be, um, I have a, a um, a slide further on that describes it a little bit better. And the one on the west side has a park on top. So there are two distinct versions of that. Um, tax increment financing is um, allowed by state law. And this is the, um, so there's, this is my um, plug for the right terms. A, a TIF is not a thing, it is the concept, but the TERS is the zone itself. Um, and of course, we're talking about increments and increments are this growth after a certain base year of the um, ad valorem taxes or property taxes. So all in all, you have, uh, these are the properties within the 300 acres that is the TERS with the 99 there set in the middle. Um, The project and finance plan um, is based on uh, some parameters that were um, part of the ordinance that founded the TERS, plus the uh, development agreement and funding agreement with Centurion that talks about things that we were going to do. Um, And so there is two portions of the revenue, one from the city and one from the county. Uh, The city is the one that is um, what we're really gonna talk about tonight. And it's um, estimated to uh, have a growth or a full amount of $129 million over the life of the 36 years and plus 30 million from the county. The county is a cap at 30. So if it's less than 36 years to reach that point, that's what it does. The city does not have a cap because we are going to be doing um, bonding, and I'll get into that for a second. Again, this is about the garage, the project is about the garages. The east garage, here it is, this is the most complicated thing ever. It is a um, a parking garage plus um, on top of it is a street a restaurant cluster and multifamily units. So all in all, I'll be back to you to talk more about this in the future when we talk about making this a condominium. And we will be owning a unit in that condo, which is shown here on this slide in the gray. Those are those public parking spaces. Then it'll be free and open to the public. I mean, funded um, a vast majority, if not all, by a federal grant that we received um, via the COG for about $30 million. That grant is 15 million in grant and 15 million in loan. The loan has to be paid back, and we've pledged the TERS revenues to pay that loan back. Um, the West Parking Garage, I don't have a great picture like the previous one, but it would look sort of like this from the top. It's at street level, and the parking is below. Right now, the developer thinks it'll just be one level below this um, park. Um, There is a list of non-project costs. This is all the development that's going to happen. So you can see here the expectation the developer has is that the value of that development will be over $660 million. And here is, um, I'm going to show you, uh, this is what's currently in the plan. Um, And it shows about $104 million worth of public costs. That includes the debt service for the loan, the garage um, uh, bond plus the interest. um, In exhibit E, you should see a uh, a table of what we think the costs are gonna incur for the TERS. So this is what the TERS funds are going to pay for and the year that they happen in. And um, exhibit F is a feasibility study. So this is the projected income for the TERS zone over its life of 36 years. Um, Council member, do you want me to con- continue with this or would you like to do that? I, I, can, I can talk about it if you'd like, Peter. Thank, thank you, thank you. Although you're, you're welcome to staff today with Mark and Peter and uh, our outside consultant, Mary. And uh, I wanna first say thank you to, uh, to the staff and uh, the outside consultant because Everybody uh, displayed great creative thinking and uh, uh, open-mindedness to improvement of the project plan. Uh, the uh, The idea that I brought up was that, uh, as uh, Peter just described, there are uh, programmed expenditures within this project plan, but the the anticipated revenues greatly exceed the uh, anticipated expenditures, which result in a large. Uh, 
uh, unprogrammed uh, amount of money within the TERS uh, that uh, is, is essentially money that would be legally restricted in certain ways because it's uh, part of that 75% of the increment that's, that goes into the TERS but uh, is not um, uh, uh, – is not currently programmed for any expenditure, and in particular, any expenditure in relation to the uh, uh, redevelopment of Collin Creek Mall, which, uh, which I, you know, as I've said for years, I, I completely support. Um, the other thing to note is that even above and beyond the uh, the amount that we anticipate, uh, the tax increment will will exceed the programmed expenses. Uh, uh, it's it's potentially uh, likely that that it will will exceed it by even more because these projections are conservative to make sure that we're which is good because it makes sure that we're able to uh, meet our obligations uh, under the uh, uh, redevelopment of Collin Creek Mall but it also means that we we might exceed the programmed expenses by even more than this uh, plan project um, I think that uh, money sitting around unprogrammed uh, is you know likely to be spent in some way and perhaps not on core city functions. So uh, I wanted to, uh, to address that issue and uh, by doing three things. The first, uh, th this was an idea of uh, 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 Mary, the outside consultant, I believe, uh, and, and a very good one. Uh, but the first major change that this language makes is uh, creating a reserve account uh, equal to 150%. This is what you see in uh, item number five on the screen. Uh, equal to 150% of the average annual principal and interest due each year on the West Garage obligations. Uh, that will uh, uh, help uh, uh, reassure uh, uh, buyers of, of the revenue bonds uh, issued on the TERS uh, even more so than they already uh, would have been. Uh, and it, uh, it creates a reserve for a specified purpose, you know, that can't just be spent uh, in, in any way, uh, uh, which I think is a positive development. The other in uh, number six here is that uh, there would be an amount up to $1.2 million annually uh, once the uh, COG loan is, is paid and retired, probably around year number 20 of the, uh, of the TERS, uh, that would uh, uh, allow uh, funding of up to $1.2 million of uh, uh, city services, uh, which would you know, allow us to, to pay for, for core city functions with some of this excess uh, money, you know, public safety, roads, um, you know, environmental services, you know, the, the kinds of things that, that, you know, waste collection and all of that, 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 that uh, go throughout the city, including in the tourist zone. So I think that would be a, a positive change that would allow uh, more of this excess revenue to be um, spent on uh, uh, core city functions. And then finally, um, if we exceed the uh, the, the uh, projections, or, or if there's there's after the 1.2 million, uh, if there is additional uh, revenue, uh, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm reading this again. This uh, the staff very nicely uh, uh, worked on this this afternoon and uh, sent this language uh, a little after five o'clock uh, once we were already meeting. Um, so n number seven, as I was initially reading it, um, I was thinking said. Uh, um, that it would be, uh, I mean, it does say that it can be used for other projects as determined by the city council in future final plan amendments. Um, I, I would uh, love to even perhaps uh, add in number seven that uh, um, that that uh, priority would be given to, to to city services to the extent that there's more than 1.2 million uh, that that's uh, being spent in the tourist zone. Uh, but essentially, that th those are the uh, the changes. I, I again greatly appreciate the staff's creative thinking and open mindedness. Uh, really enjoyed the call with with Mark and 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 uh, uh, Peter and Mary and. Uh, um, and, and uh, as I understand it, the staff is, uh, uh, I haven't run that last one I said by, by the staff, but w with the exception of that is not opposed to these changes. So. No, no, we're not opposed to the changes. Although I, I um, so what we're really talking about over this extra that we've come uh, with this plan that the council member is talking about is really about $5 million in total. Um, because once you add all the rest in, we really don't have much left over. Um, the debate becomes whether there is going to be more. Um, we, uh, not only is a debate there could be more, but there, of course there always could be less. Mm -hmm. So we like to always have a little bit of play involved with that, just because we're talking about 36 or 30 years from now, really. And so um, with that would be um, changes within two exhibits. So I'm going to 
presuppose your motion. Um, and so the, the exhibit D would change, would add the, the, the TERS reserve account and then the municipal services within the project list. It wouldn't assign any money because um, we don't quite know that yet, but it would be part of a project. Um, and then, uh, so council member, uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, I should say, that's where the extra money goes, right? So there's oh, not a projected money. So, so, so that is in there, because I, I, I knew I knew we had discussed that, and then, then uh, I was reviewing this on the fly while we were meeting. So, so fault, thank, yes. thank, you for the, <laughs> thank you for the clarification, yeah. Peter. So it is in there. So Perfect. it is thank in there. You. So it, this is the list of projects. So there's that. And then um, uh, this would be the, the previous one in case you wanted to compare. So the number is roughly the same, but... It, 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 it should be added on. And then the, the big difference becomes this exhibit E. This is the um, estimated timeline for project costs to be incurred. And you can see that there's a lot more costs adding up. And so um, I don't know what is there. Yeah. So um, all in all, you still have the same amount of money. It's just reprogrammed um, per the council member suggestions. And, and so in, uh, in follow-up on uh, the excellent presentation that Peter just gave, I want to again say thank you to Peter and, uh, and Mary and Mark, the, the whole staff, for uh, the flexibility to think creatively on the fly. You know, um, I'm sure there could have been a temptation to say, no, let's just, let's just leave it this way. And uh, that's the excellent staff that we have, you know, to, uh, to, to take ideas seriously and uh, be willing to think creatively on the fly. So um, with that, I move that we approve the ordinance with the project and finance plan amended as presented. I second. second. No. Oh, can I ask a question? Yeah, but question. I just want to understand, are we saying that this $5 million or whatever is more or less with this change, we're saying that it can be used outside of the TERS in any part of the city? No, it can only, okay. in those 36 years, it can only be used within the, the zone. Once the 36 years is over, and if there is any money left in the fund, it would go back into the general fund. Okay, so it's just after the 36 years. In That's the 36 correct. years, it still must be used in the TERS right. area. But future councils can make a decision within that, that time frame of 36 years how to spend the money. And so if there is, say, you know, like we do a fantastic job and it's $100 million of unprogrammed money, the council can choose what that $100 million would be spent on. It's not going to be $100 million. I, I, think the, I think the big aspect of this is adding in the municipal services as a project to be able to pay for services within the zone that might otherwise uh, be paid through the general fund. So this allows for municipal services such as roads, public safety, and others to be listed as a project for some of those uh, TERS captured funds to be able to um, pay for as part of that uh, project. Yeah, right. that's what I was just trying to clarify. If we were, we were trying to say we're going to start using TERS funds outside of the zone or not. no and then of course you only have it says pay as you go at that point so it's whatever we have at that point can be spent of course you can't spend money unless it's part of the project plan so this is making it part of the project plan. councilman greg thank you um just a couple in in similar to um mayor pro tem's question um, and you can let that go really small because you can't read it when it's really large anyway. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I just wanted to say um, uh, this is a, has been a, an extremely complicated project for the city. And the documents that um, uh, contain all of this information go on for hundreds of pages for which there's numerous tables um, for which there was a conversation this afternoon with one council member and a few staff that want to change a lot of the impact on the tables. And and I don't feel um, a motion to immediately accept it is comfortable because uh, I haven't had time to really look through all the tables and see what the really impact is other than but everybody saying, well, it's going to generate $5 million and, and we'll use it somewhere. Um, so I'm a little bit concer concerned about that. Um, I trust the staff. Um, I trust them saying that it's going to be used in the TERS. The concern I have, did you say that there was 99 pieces of property within the TERS? There's 63, I believe. 63, 63 okay. And so we're talking about property that's outside of the mall area as well because it's on 
the south side of 14th and the north side of it's 15th? from 16th, which is where the senior center is, and mm -hmm. all the way through to PGBT. Okay, so we've got a much larger span. Um, and uh, the only concern that I had in listening to the discussion is we're focusing in on what it does, what does it do for the garages and, and nothing about what's going on in any, any of the other locations. So that's my hesitancy um, and comfort level. Um, it's not that I am opposed to it from the standpoint of using the money within the TERS. It is that I am opposed to doing a major modification that floods through hundreds of tables and we've had five minutes to discuss it. So to be frank, the um, change is very, very, actually very limited to the monies that were not programmed in the reports that you saw when the agenda was published. Um, so we're really talking about um, $30 million of unprogrammed money now being sort of programmed into a, an idea of, of city services. That being said, um, future councils can change that at their leisure. So you can change the project plan. It's not cast in stone. If you remember, we've changed the TERS number two one several times. So we can do that. The council member wanted to, the deputy, sorry, I keep getting all the titles mixed up. <laughs> deputy Mayor Pro Tem wanted to make sure that the uh, future councils understood what the direction we were going, as opposed to just leaving them floating in space on unprogrammed. So what we're really doing is programming about $30 million. If a project comes along, whether it be economic development grant or a bridge replacement, um, those, pro those funds can be reprogrammed. What can't be reprogrammed in all of this, which has not changed on this change, is repayment of the bonds and the repayment of the loan. Okay, well, I thank you for that explanation. I just wanted to register that, that with this kind of change, it would be nice not to just bring it into a giant pile, dump it on the desk and say, I make a motion to approve <clears throat> without anybody reading. Okay, I have a motion. I have a motion and a second, correct? Oh, judge, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Maria. Judge, I'm, uh, it's not judge. I'm sorry. I'm still in my court mode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, um, so I have the same concern. I, I'm looking at these proposed changes, and I, I, I see that there really isn't a um, very strong, um, I guess, in, uh, effect on what's currently being proposed. And I hear that from you, Peter, but... My, my, my concern is um, Deputy Mayor Protan heard about it at five while we're in the executive session and saw it for the very first time after the executive session started. I'm looking at it for the very first time right now and trying to wrap my head around because I'm not a number person, obviously. Um, it, 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 and... I'm going to trust that you're saying it, it doesn't make that much influence, but what I'm trying to figure out is why are we bringing amendments on the day we are um, supposed to be passing a consent agenda item um, and then pulling it out the last minute and now we're supposed to say it's okay because we've all done our due diligence, but you council member too, you're just a little bit slow. So, you know, you just got to do it some other time. I, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant about that. I, I feel like I'm not being responsible to the constituents by not <clears throat> understanding what we're doing. Um, I, I did understand a consent agenda item, but I, I did not understand a proposed um, amendment. Uh, Mayor and Council, as, as you all know, we have a, a process for uh, addressing our agenda and additional questions on the agenda where we receive questions Sunday night staff provides responses hopefully by uh, around noon on uh, on Monday this was one of the items that we had uh, a, a few questions that came in on Sunday night that we did provide responses back to council uh, this afternoon for your review trying to uh, provide that information prior to um, uh, the uh, the agenda this evening it's always uh, a time crunch when we get to that point of, of providing information um, we try to get that out as fast as we possibly can. And, but in discussing this today with uh, our consultant, Mary Petty, uh, and Peter today, the, um, there, these changes do matter. Make no mistake, it is adding a project in. It does, it does allow those municipal services to be captured as a, as a project. 
um, but in the substantive um, project plan with the dollars allocated with some of those key aspects that we have direction previously from council, those aspects did not change in this. So we are still uh, operating within that general guidance, but we are we did expand uh, what was being reported to council, what was in the packet to include this other additional option, this other project in there. Um, but the timing side of that was um, unfortunately just due to our process, our agenda process, uh, but we will try to have that information out in advance uh, when possible. Councilman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to paraphrase this for the sake of clarity for myself and uh, everyone else. <clears throat> um, correct me if I'm mistaken at any point. What we're looking at on the screen represents the sum total of changes proposed by Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't, uh, in effect, really change anything of substance in the 233 pages of Exhibit A for the uh, item we're talking about, Consent Item T. Um, this just puts prioritization on money that isn't already planned on being used. Is that correct? I, I wouldn't classify it quite that way because this is those are funds. Again, we, we had this discussion about the repayment of the loan and then what happens to those funds after the loan has been repaid. So this was un, at that point, these funds become unallocated within the plan. And so the option at that point was uh, was part of the concern for the deputy mayor pro tem of what happens to those funds, how are those allocated, and what is the, the direction and the addition of the project to uh, be able to utilize those funds if the increment generates the revenue. I'm trying to make sure I get all the caveats and I'm looking at Peter for this. Um, really, becomes, really becomes the challenge um, for this. So in that discussion, uh, in looking at that, if the increment exists, in that time frame, this provides a project by that would have a priority to utilize those funds. Mr. Braster, please fill in the blanks that I missed. Sure. So the precise changes are three things. It's uh, on this numbered list is already in the plan on page seven, um, one through four. Number five, six, and seven were added, um, and they are just a, a a roadmap on how to spend the money that is beyond what is already allocated. Then you have this exhibit, which has added two projects to the list underneath the COG loan, the garage principal and garage interest. And then you had um, exhibit E changes. Um, that just shows, and I don't think I can show it too fast, but down here, um, there's a, an additional uh, stream of revenue that goes on to uh, into those projects. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that's that was the changes. Uh, other, all the other pages remain the same. Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll keep this quick. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, these changes would have no impact on the Collin Creek Mall redevelopment because everything is subordinated to the items that relate to the Collin Creek Mall redevelopment. My initial preference was was even simpler to just uh, cap our contribution and terminate the TERS after we've completed those projects the way that the county is doing at 30 million. Uh, it turns out we cannot do that legally under state law because we cannot terminate the TERS before the revenue bonds are paid off and we can't pay off the revenue bonds early because that affects the yield to the bondholders. So, um, so that turns out not to be an option, even though that would be simpler. This is slightly less simple, although not, um, not, not so much so, but the idea is rather than having money sit around that may, uh, you know, when, 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 when money is sitting around, it could be spent on who knows what the idea is to focus it on core municipal services that are being delivered within the TERS uh, so that, so that, that, that funding is being used in that way. Um, and uh, I, I understand the concerns that council members uh, Grady and two, and I think mayor pro tem Prince may, may have, may have raised um, about just seeing this during the meeting. This is obviously the, the, the first time, we as a council have really dug into this. We saw a preliminary plan when we created the TERS in January of 2020. Um, you know, obviously we, we were not able to discuss it prior to the council meeting because of the Open Meetings Act. You know, that would have been a violation for us to discuss it before then. So naturally this is the first time we're discussing it. Toward that end, uh, if there is discomfort with passing this with these changes tonight, and, and if other council members would prefer, I'd be happy to withdraw my motion to, to pass presented as amended 
and uh, and substitute a motion to table if, uh, if 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 there's a preference for that, so that there's time to digest the proposal and consider it at our next meeting. I'm ready to move forward. Councilman Smith. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see. Uh, let, let's end this on a positive note. First of all, to, to those of you in the audience and, and anybody watching on Plano TV, as your eyes are starting to glaze over with all this, the next time you drive by and you look at Collin Creek Mall and that pile of dirt, everything's going on there, I want you to think about these people. This, this, is, this is one itsy bitsy teeny weeny part of this whole plan that was put together. So you look at that and you think about what has gone in manpower wise and just creative thinking wise of our staff to bring us to this point where we're now arguing about what we're going to do with excess money that comes up in the plan. So congratulations. Well done. I agree. Let's put this off. So everybody be comfortable, but think about that. The next time you see Collin Creek mall, everything that went into it to get us to the point we're at today. Thanks, Peter. Peter, you haven't actually slept in a couple of years, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was all one color hair. So, yeah. Peter, yeah. I, Peter, I have a question. Um, since Deputy Mayor Tro Protan has uh, been very considerate in, in thinking about possibly table, uh, withdrawing his motion and, and um, tabling, I want to know whether or not that would have any impact or any delay in the current development. I, I just want to make sure that this is not something that absolutely has to be considered and and you know i think pushing today. it off to the the next meeting is not a problem i don't believe that this would affect the critical path of the project um that was already approved earlier tonight with the uh, service and assessment plans um so if you if you want to wait to the first meeting in june i think it, it's more than fine well then, uh, with that, if I may, I will withdraw my, mo my motion to approve, uh, present it as amended, and uh, instead make a motion to table. Okay. Second. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion to table item T uh, with a second. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero to table item T. Thank you. Items for uh, individual consideration. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer will amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public for Public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one. Public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2020-16 to amend the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance of the City, Ordinance Number 2015-5-2, as heretofore amended. Expanding Specific Use Permit Number 4 for Sewage Treatment Plant with Restrictions and Granting Specific Use Permit Number 162 for Service Yard with Restrictions on 17.1 acres of land located on the east side of Los Rios Boulevard 1,030 feet north of 14th Street in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, presently zoned agricultural with specific use permit number four for sewage treatment plant, directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city, providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a public publication clause, and an effective date. Applicant, North Texas Municipal Water District. This item was tabled at the April 6th and April 26th City Council meetings. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and Executives. I'm Christina Day, Director of Planning. And the applicant has submitted a letter requesting to table this item to the June 28th, 2021 meeting. Uh, in order to resolve some items discussed during a May 7th meeting with neighbors. Um, I'm available for questions you might have regarding this item. 
but that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Day. Are there any questions for staff on this item? Councilman Smith. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Christina, uh, if I'm if I'm correct remembering on this, that uh, with, with the current uh, agricultural zoning on the uh, on the property where the the water plant uh, now resides, the the with the district with that zoning be able to, to expand that plant <coughs> on onto other areas of this uh, of this lot uh, without you know changing the zoning with uh, the requesting the supplement or would they <coughs> still be confined to the to the existing uh, lot constraint for the water processing plant um, this is a request for a specific use permit to expand the treatment plant to allow them to build their operations building um, further to the west and the zoning would continue to, it could be expanded, the SUP could be expanded further south because uh, the there was a second zoning request that would have limited that by rezoning additional property to the south, but that was withdrawn consistent with um, both the, the district asked for that, but it was also consistent with public feedback. Gotcha. So, so, so again, this, this doesn't include the the uh, the I'm trying to think the the geographical the, the, the small parcel of land that uh, that the city sold to the district. This is that's excluded from what we're being considered on the uh, the SUP. Actually, this is part of that land, but it it was subdivided. There's a it's only the northern portion, not the southern portion of the property. Okay. So, so again, if let's let's pretend if the supplement. Uh, the request for the SUP was not being presented to us and being still agricultural zoned, that would allow for expansion of the water treatment facility on the entire piece of land. Is that, am I correct in remembering it, it that? It would. Any, any place that's zoned agriculture allows by uh, an SUP request to, for sewage treatment plant. Okay, great, great. I just want to be sure that I remember that correctly. Thank you. That is correct. <clears throat> Councilman Schwent Williams. Yes, Christina. Um, to make sure I'm understanding properly, the SUP that is requested to be extended, that includes the ability to build not just the admin building, but sewage, the purpose of sewage treatment plant as well. Is that correct? Uh, there are restrictions included um, in the request that would limit it to not having additional treatment facilities. Okay, so the admin building only without the ability to extend the current footprint of sewage treatment facilities. That is correct. Okay, I, I, I'm unable to see the verbiage because there was a request to table and we didn't get that this time around. However, I'm, right. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not quite comfortable tabling this because the letter citing the request to table said that uh, it was to work on resolving some of the items discussed during the May 7th meeting with concerned neighbors. <laughs> However, I'm given to understand that there was no additional discussion with those neighbors until a couple of hours ago. Um, the applicant is registered and I believe uh, could provide additional testimony. That'd be great. <clears throat> okay. Um, We've, we've had a request to table this item till June 28th, but we do have some speakers. So um, I'd be glad to uh, entertain uh, each speaker for two minutes each, uh, being that we're going to rehear this on June 28th. So if you'll read the uh, speaker's names, we'd, we'd appreciate it. <clears throat> Did you want to? Yeah, I'll hear from the applicant first. The applicant Excuse me, first? I'm sorry. Okay. So that would be Mark Simon and or Brad Williams. Good evening, Council. I'm Mark Simon. I'm uh, Assistant Deputy for Engineering at North Texas Municipal Water District. Uh, the, the request to table for tonight um, is an extension of the request to table we made on April 26th. We did, in fact, have a meeting at our offices on April or on May 7th. Um, with all the other speakers who are here at the meeting tonight. We spent about two and a half hours talking about uh, the plant, uh, what our plans were for the plant, what some of their concerns were. I think for us why the meeting was different was that we had had two other previous public meetings where we invited 
Um, in some cases, over 3,000 people, and we had less than four attendees at one of them. This time, we had four attendees who had not previously participated in the process, and that provided us some additional feedback um, that allowed us to take some specific action items, including some items that our operations people have already started to address at the site. So um, we're re you know, respectfully requesting to table the item until June uh, 28th to allow us time to work on the items that we can immediately address, and then also to make some adjustments to the landscaping plan and some of the screening. I've been working with the um, City of Plano Urban Forester to talk about how we collect, could collaborate on some additional screening along the north boundary by us providing either nursery stock or the funds for those types of trees, whether that would be useful for the Los Rios Park. So these are some of the examples of things that we're kind of um, trying to, to work on. But as you know, um, the request to table had to be presented you know, by May 17th, and we met on May 7th, so we really only had five working days to fix all these problems before you know, we had to either make a decision. So with that, I'll maintain any questions. Any questions for the applicant? I, I do. Oh, it, it's real, I, I would appreciate um, if you could um, provide the information of the public hearing that you're going to have with the neighbors to the city council as well, because I'm kind of curious as what are some of the things that you you, um, you know you guys are presenting as solutions to um, some of the complaints or uh, concerns of our residents. And I, I, I would like to hear it more than just from emails and texts. And I, I like to actually um, like to see it my, for myself. So if you could just provide the information, it'd be great. Provide it through Plano staff or like, yeah. so, okay. I mean, yes. Sure, that's no problem. We have, you know, some presentations we've given previously public as well as some, some updates we've been making recently. Councilman Williams. Yes, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so uh, how did the meeting on May 7th end with the neighbors? I mean, I, I understand it lasted for a couple of hours. A lot of things were discussed. How did it end um, that on, I think it was eight working days later, but uh, that you sent the request to table. But what was, what was the determination at the end of that meeting? What were the next steps? So um, the next steps for us were we were going to take a look at some of the items, um, both myself, my landscape architect, and, and our attorney uh, went to visit some of the, the, the neighborhood, um, uh, the newer, newer uh, participants in the meeting. Um, we've been working on some line of sight identification issues, and then um, we, we offered to continue to meet um, in you know, a few months if there's additional concerns. Um, you know, we've, we've shared quite a bit of information, um, both publicly, um, it's available on our website. Um, you know, really, for us, this is about our staff who works, you know, hard every day um, in really substandard conditions in, in many cases. And um, we want to do right by the neighborhood. And we, we know the challenges of operating the, the facility in, in that location. Um, but, you know, at the end of the meeting, I think we, we agreed to continue to work with the neighbors and to address as many of their concerns as we could. And so we're trying to do that through more updates to the plan that, you know, that we're preparing, you know, for June 28th. All right, thank you. Can you help me understand how the request to table until a month from now to work out items with the neighbors um, can happen when you determine to follow up with the neighbors in a few months? I'm not seeing the connection. Okay. so. So some of the items were related to lighting. We, we obviously couldn't replace all the lighting within, you know, five days. So we went out and did a survey and tried to identify, you know, how, what lights can we relocate? What changes can we make? You know, we still have safety and security of the site to, con to contend with, and how do we manage that? So that's part of the plan, right? Um, as far as the landscaping was concerned, we previously submitted that for an exhibit for the planning and zoning, but it's not at the stage of the process where the landscape plan is fully reviewed by staff. So we've made updates to the exhibit so that it could be shared with the council to see the extent of the landscaping that we're proposing for the site. So we've, we've gone out and made some more adjustments. And again, I was there with the landscape architect last week trying to identify how we can manage the line of sight issues um, from the neighbors across the street, as well as contend with some of the 
overhead power lines that are in the area that, that we're going to have some constraints with. And then the northern boundary, of course, the property doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the city of Plano. Um, if you were to go out there to the site now, you would identify, you know, a number of trees that have died or been removed over a period of time that have exposed the, the facility if you were driving south from Los Rios. That was a comment that was brought up during the meeting. And so this is how I reached out to the Parks Department and the Urban Forester to talk about how we could collaborate and, and to address that side of the facility as well. Um, Mr. Mayor, if I could, I represent the district. I, I wanted to make sure that uh, Council Williams got his question answered. Uh, for the record, Brad Williams, 2728 North Harwood Street in Dallas. So, uh, Councilman Williams, I think your question was, what's the connection between our request to table and a follow-up two months from now? I think you were wondering about that connection. And I think we're confusing um, some, some things that were said. We, during that meeting, suggested to the neighbors that were present that if they would like to set up a recurring meeting you know, every so many months to check in with us as the district to, to hear what their more recent experiences have been, uh, how we're doing, what can we do for you today, um, give them updates. So there was a separate offer to, you know, regardless of what happens with the zoning case, to continue to meet with the neighbors after the zoning case is over. Uh, and I think that's the two months maybe that uh, Mr. Simon mentioned and that you were asking about. Um, the way we left the meeting was we received some feedback and we took it upon ourselves to huddle internally, study what could be done, figure out what we could do to try to solve some of those concerns, and we got to work immediately. I personally went to the site that afternoon after the meeting to take some pictures from the neighborhood to make sure we understood what their experience was, how they were experiencing the facility, so that we could get a good sense of what can we do, what should we do to help mitigate their concerns. So. Uh, we've actually been hard at work in the last two weeks since our meeting trying to make some progress. We just need a little bit more time to make, make sure we can do that uh, and bring to the council some more concrete results that we are just still in the process of formulating. So that's really the essence of the request. Okay, thank you for that. So am I correct in understanding that the request to table was not to continue working with the neighbors until the June 28th meeting, but to investigate some of the items that were discussed at the May 7th meeting. Am I interpreting that correctly? I, I think so. I, we're, we want to continue to work with the neighbors in perpetuity. There's no, there's no expiration on our willingness to work with the neighbors. As it relates to the zoning case specifically, yes, the time between May 7th and June 28th is intended to give us enough time to formulate concrete commitments that we can bring to the council and to the neighbors and say, here's what we can do to try to address your concerns. We've had a chance to visit with some of them this evening to talk about that, gotten some more direction. So, you know, it's the conversations that we're having are fruitful and beneficial, and we want the opportunity to continue to have them. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I imagine that the, the odor was a big topic of conversation at the May we 7th meeting. We talked a lot about that on May 7th. Yes, we did. Was there any determination about uh, exploration of resolving that? It's been a big issue for a very long time. The district is committed to working on the odor problem and mitigating that to the best of its ability. I, the engineers are gonna to need to tell you about what they're doing and what they can do. Um, but there's, yeah, we've got some ideas for how to, to continue to improve on the odor if you would like Mr. Simon to tell you about it. Uh, go ahead, Rick. I, I've heard, I've spoken with others with the district about the odors, but uh, the only answer I've ever been given was uh, uh, basically odor control caps on the tanks. but. Uh, my understanding is that overwhelmingly the problem isn't with the tanks, it's from the sewers. Well, that's nothing the district, I don't think, can control. Is that correct, Mark? Uh, it would depend on the location. I mean, there, it could be part of our system. It could be part of Plano's system, and that's something that we would have to work with our partners at Plano to identify where that specific source is. As far as the plant is concerned, you know, the district has invested about $8 million in odor control since about 2012. Can, can I interrupt, the site? please? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I apologize, but this odor issue is really a separate issue from the zoning issue. It's, it needs to be a land use uh, discussion. You know, maybe you can have them back to talk about that right. at a different meeting, Mark. Right. And I would add that, you know, we've sent, many of you have gotten letters from us in the past or emails from our old executive, interim executive director and our current executive director, Jenna Covington, is here tonight. and. We're open to meeting with any and every one of you to explain how the facility operates, what the plan is for the facility, 
how it's connected to the overall regional system that Plano's part of. I mean, we, we really are a partner with the city of Plano, you know, in operating this facility and the overall, you know, regional wastewater system. You want Councilman Smith? And, and Paige, listen to what I'm going to ask and let me know if I'm okay on this. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe my question does, does actually deal with land use because, I mean, uh, we consider a lot of factors in, in considering land, land use, not the least of which is uh, the effect on the surrounding areas, the effect on the, the neighbors and concerns there because, I mean, we, we work for these people. We don't work for the water district. No offense, but these are our, these are our bosses. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I don't know if you, if you folks were here tonight when we had uh, a gentleman was here speaking earlier, uh, Mr. Lennon, I believe, and was was talking about the uh, the single force main valve that we have and potential problems there. And the reason I'm asking this because I'd like to get since you're engineering get get your opinion on it for thinking about the land use aspect of this is um, I think what's happening what we're hearing it we're feeling is is there's there's a lack of trust between the residents who, who, let's face it, I don't live there, you don't live, they live there, and and the district, there's a lack of trust there. So could, could you at least like address that issue while you're here? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand this, and I'm not an engineer, you are, and I believe Mr. Linden is a 40-year uh, experienced wastewater engineer, so he probably knows more about it than, than most of us do, but, okay. but I'd like to get a the, 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 the issue is that the um, part of this that deals with the expanding for the sewage treatment plant is a, bringing it into compliance because that was um, built a little bit over the line a long time ago. So that's why this odor issue is not really part of this zoning case. Right. Even, though it, even though it is on the land and they are using it. Right. Because that's not what this... Um, Zoning cases. Trying to do. Mark, do you want to address some of that? So, uh, Councilman Smith and, and Councilman Williams, I, I think what we need is is an opportunity to talk about the operational side of things. Whether it is um, a, a force main, whether it is an odor control, I think what I'm hearing from Council is a briefing on the operation side um, would help y'all to understand the background of how the how the facility is actually being utilized, um, what some of the, the conditions are there. Uh, but that would be separate from this particular case. I think we can get some of that information back. I saw a letter come through, I think, late this uh, evening from uh, Mr. Williams. But we can get some of those operational um, uh, issues uh, addressed, either trying to uh, arrange a special meeting um, to do some briefings via Zoom so that we can do it as soon as possible uh, to, to try to keep this on the time schedule we have available, but I do understand that those questions exist and it impacts, um, you know, the neighborhood and, and uh, y'all have questions along those lines. So I'm happy to arrange for briefings um, with the district. Okay. okay. So I, I, I just want to um, say that I, you know, I was on planning and zoning for a long time. And for, to me, I think that it's important when you make land use decisions that you consider um, the environmental impact. And so I feel like this somewhat is um, considering the environmental health impact on the land use decision. So, you know, I could see this as a little bit of a gray area. So I'm okay if we want to do something separate, but I wouldn't want to make a decision on this before some of the environmental health concerns that I personally have were addressed. So if we do that, I don't want it to be just an operational discussion. I think we need to it needs to be looked at from an environmental health standpoint too, not just operations. Sure, we're happy to, happy to add that to the list. Thank you, Mr. Council Mayor. Council. So um, this is an extension specifically on what we're doing today, which is the motion to table. And my question is an extension of Deputy Mayor Pro Tem and Councilman Smith's question with regard to the concerns being addressed. So. This item has been tabled twice already, and this will be the third time. Each time I believe there was a reason because there is a concern that needs to be addressed, and then um, a, I guess a, a re, re look at the, the, the zoning. And, and, and my, I guess my question is, why don't we do something that's um, 
you know, to do a broader information um, gathering where um, people get more notice of um, information exchange and having the resident be notified way in advance so that they can have a chance to respond to the, uh, to, to air their, express their concern. Instead of this, you know, every two weeks we come back and then it gets table again because somebody raised something that you haven't thought of. And also in the meantime, allow, you know, council members to also hear all the concerns and be able to, ex uh, exp I guess, express them or to deal with them in a, in, in a more informed setting. I, I, I just, I'm not hearing enough that's addressing the resident's concern. I'm not hearing enough in the environmental side, I'm not hearing enough in the, um, the land use side, and, I'm, and I, I, I don't understand why we piecemeal these motion and table. So I'm asking you, is there a possibility of maybe tabling this a little bit longer so that we can actually get informed information about what's going on? So I'm not sure how much you know about the history because you didn't get a briefing from uh, Ms. Day, but you know we had public meetings in November. We had public hearings in November. We had public hearings in December. <laughs> we had a public meeting again in January. We had another public hearing in January. You know, we came before you. There was a there was a procedural issue with a picture of a sign for the April 6th, and then the item was tabled for us. It wasn't a request to table. And this is how we ended up at the April 26th meeting, and, and it was you know recommended that we continue to do public outreach. We were able to arrange for a public meeting, but we couldn't get that accomplished before April 26th. So, I mean, this is part of the process. But there has been public outreach. There's an active web page that we update you know, with meetings or any changes that we've been making to the site plans. This has all been publicly available. We have invited um, directly um, upwards of 100 people to each of these meetings, as well as through the City of Plano's next door participation, have notified homeowners associations, neighborhood associations, all of this was publicly available. And we, we just did not get the participation that we had hoped for. I'm sorry, with all due respect, I mean, giving us information is different from addressing inf uh, inf the concerns of the resident. So telling us that this is the way it's going to be versus, you know, we hear you and we're solving the problem. Those are two different things. And I don't believe that these every two weeks type of tabling really is addressing the concerns of the resident. That's why they are writing us and they are telling us that they have concerns that's not being addressed. So what I'm asking you is whether or not there is a possibility of getting an extended tabling in which information, discuss, a true discussion can be had in which the concerns of the residents in that area can be addressed. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, I, it's certainly not the district's intent to have it be a my way or the highway discussion. That's not at all the intention. Uh, if it's the council's pleasure that we table this case beyond June 28th, the district is amenable to that. I think what what I'm feeling, what I'm hearing, sensing from some of my colleagues and from the citizens that I've spoken with and heard from, is that um, while this this you know technically is about a building, um, as I mentioned, I, I feel like there's more environmental health concerns wrapped up in this decision for me personally. And, and I think that until those can be, as um, my colleague said, um, addressed, I think it's hard for us to move forward with the decision. So I think we want to have a better feeling that you're not just addressing landscape, you know, issues, that you're um, getting to the core root of, of the issue. And so that's really what I'm I'm wanting to see is addressing some of those um, deeper issues and concerns. Yeah, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, following up on uh, the comments that other council members have made, and I think specifically when uh, when you guys were responding to Council Member Williams' questions, you talked about the process that you guys are going through right now, uh, uh, have been going through and, and specifically are going through after the May 7th meeting with residents, asking yourself the question, what can and what should we do to mitigate these concerns 
Uh, I heard a mention of concrete commitments. I was wondering uh, if you guys could provide some examples of uh, issues that uh, or features of, of the request that, that the district is open to changing, uh, specifically what you're looking at right now that you would continue looking at if given the extra time through, through a tabling. Sure. I'll take a stab at it, and then if I forget anything, Mark, jump in there. But the one that we've already made progress on, as Mark said, was the lighting. We heard from the neighbors early on in our meeting that we've got a glare issue, and we said, good to know. We will look into that. And so we sent our ops people out there one evening, uh, you know, went into the neighborhood, took a look, realized, yeah, we've got some, some uh, pole lights that could be pointed in a better direction to be less impactful. Okay. Those have actually been removed. Those four lights that we identified have been removed, so they are no longer functional on the property at all. Thereafter, we're going to look into adding some lights uh, that are much lower, so it will cast you know less light out generally, and then remove even more of the pole lights on the property. So that's what we're studying. We have already purchased some of the material to accomplish that. We just don't have it all yet. So again, we'd like to be able to come back to the council and say, hey, we've solved the light problem. We've done all these things, and not just we intend to do them. We want to be able to tell you that we have done it. Um, we did hear about screening and visibility and how the, how the facility looks from the neighborhood and as you're driving down Los Rios. So we said, let us relook at our landscape plan. As Mark said, we, were, we had our landscape architect visit the site again, uh, look at line of sight items, things like that. Um, and as I said, the, the district is committed to continuing to improve the odor situation as technology and as funds permit. Well, well thank you for that response. And, and so just to, to recap, if we vote to table tonight and the district is given extra time to work on the residents' concerns, the, the plan that we end up considering after tabling would not be the same plan that's currently before us. There, there, would, there would be changes made to respond to the residents' concerns. The landscape plan that we are proposing, which is not part of the zoning request, but I believe staff wanted an opportunity to look at that prior to uh, any council consideration, that will be different. I'm not sure that the SUP itself will have anything that's meaningly different. Um, there is a very important um, uh, condition in the SUP that relates to expansion of tr uh, treatment process units outside of the existing geographic boundary of the plant. So although the SUP boundary is being pushed out to Los Rios Boulevard, where the office building will be located, it's a very clear condition in the SUP that we cannot expand any treatment units past what is out there today, or as of January 1st. So that's a very important condition, I think, for the council and the neighbors to understand is that this is, there's no hidden plan to, to shoehorn more stuff as part of this request. And it's, you know, to leak out closer to Los Rios Boulevard. The intention is to keep the process units where they are located today within that geographic boundary. So I think that goes to maybe your question, Councilman Smith, a little bit earlier on. I wanna make sure we got it really addressed. So I'm not sure that the, that those SUP conditions would be different. We will happily consider any suggestions from staff or, or the neighbors about how to make that condition better or stronger or more secure or something like that. If that's, if somebody has something to offer, we'll absolutely consider it. Sure, well, thank you for that answer. I appreciate that. Sure. Okay. Councilman Williams. Yes, uh, just to provide a little clarification, I'm sure not, you didn't get uh, very good attendance at uh, any of your meetings or open houses, however you term them, but uh, about 100 or so Plano residents responded in opposition to this before the planning and zoning case was heard. I'm looking at about five pages of them. Now, I don't know if they all live in the neighborhood, uh, but they all do live in Plano. Yeah, we're aware of that. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. Council Warren Bow. Uh -huh. I have a question. You were, you mentioned about uh, uh, the process units. Um, what do we as a council have the power? Just you, you are saying that you are not going to expand it, but what if you do? Like, are you going to notify us? What kind of power do we have if you do so in the future? Because I think there's a mistrust that one of the council member commented already. Yeah, no, and we talked about that mistrust at our May 7th meeting. And some of the residents have lived in this neighborhood for a very long time and were involved in district meetings that took place in the 1980s. Uh, and, you know, it's our understanding that, you know, things were said that weren't ultimately followed through with. And that's regrettable. Exactly. None of us were involved. Uh, so there's only so much we can do today to apologize for whatever may have been said in, in those meetings at that time. But it's our commitment today not to repeat uh, not to repeat that and to make sure that 
the city has uh, a way to enforce the SUP condition. And then that's, that's what it would be. If the, if the district were to violate a term of the SUP, the city has its usual zoning enforcement opportunities uh, as part of that SUP. Yeah, I agree. I think most of us understand that uh, the hesitation that we have, you know, approving this request is that this is kind of the only opportunity for the council to really, you know, look into this to help, you know, all these issues being addressed, even though they may not be directly related, but I think they are kind of the environmental concerns and health concerns. So if we don't address these issues now, you know, the residents don't feel this could ever be, you know, trustworthily addressed in the future, right? Uh, you know, what do we have kind of to hold you guys accountable for this? That's why we have reservations for all this. Well, I suppose I'm, I'm, you know, my, my answer to your question might depend on what it is you are wanting to hold us accountable for. Well, so for example, first of all, I mean, the orders needs to be, you know, you know, treated so that the, this is the first, you know, right away thing, right? So the orders cannot be present and that's a big nuisance for the residents. And second of all, it's very important that the plant cannot expand your treatment capacity, right? Because it's just, it's limited. You have newer, you know, treatment, you know, areas up to the north, and that's a very big commitment. The residents need you guys to <coughs> deliver, basically. And then there's others, but you mentioned about the lighting. That seems to be easier to do, and that's not that hard. Um, peak flow project, right? The ongoing peak flow. So there are so many things tied into this. You don't come in front of us often. <laughs> yeah. Right? And that's why. We would have to um, think about how to best accomplish that with maybe consultation with your city attorney and city staff on how to yeah, address I, some of these items. I personally don't think we can approve it, you know, without the whole thing being, you know, addressed because it is health care, health concern, environmental concern. It's all bundled together. It's not a simple just a SUP or rezoning thing. In, in mayor and council, we will work with uh, Jenna Covington and, and Mark and staff to, to arrange a briefing on the operational side. We, we know that council has a number of questions that they want to be able to get into on the health and safety and, and those operations. We will uh, arrange for a time, um, hopefully very soon, uh, to be able to have that, uh, have that for council so that you can dig, dig deeper into those issues. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. We'll uh, uh, have a vote in just a minute. We're going to let these speakers speak, and then uh, we'll make a decision on the table. Sure. Mr. Mayor, if I could, if, if the motion to table, for whatever reason, does not pass, we would appreciate the opportunity to revisit with the council. And if we wind up having a hearing tonight, we want the chance to give you a more complete presentation about the request, since you didn't have the benefit of it from staff. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have some speaker cards. We do. The first one is Cassandra Bull. Good evening. Uh, Cassandra Bull, 4120 Sonora Drive, Plano, Texas. Um, I do want to express my thanks to Executive Director Covington, Engineer Simon, and the North Texas Municipal Water District Council Williams for meeting with the residents. The three and a half hour meeting on May 7th was informative and it was especially helpful to get to meet two more families who resided close to the plant uh, 10 years plus. Many issues above and beyond landscaping were discussed, including the pernicious odor problems and the lack of on-site spill containment critical to the safe operation of the plant. This safety net kept the February spill at Wilson Creek from being more serious. The proposed site plan will increase impervious land to 355,000 square feet, eight acres. So our opposition to this expanded SUP is more than merely aesthetics. The proposed location requires not only its footprint of the building, but two new drives and two parking lots. All but the existing maintenance drive will occur on land outside of the current SUP and on land that is permeable and protected by 40 feet, mature trees and land berms. This loss of permeable land further directs excess rainwater or spill 
downhill to the Los Rios Park floodplain, merely capping the capacity, which has been promised many times over the decades, is not due diligence by the city and the North Texas Municipal Water District. The on-site capacity must be reduced so that employees and residents are better protected. We have good faith that a better plan can be found without expanding the SCP. Thank you. The next speaker is Scott Linden, and then he'll be followed by Kathy Alexander. I'm Scott Linden, 3905 Bandera Drive. Uh, I guess my concern uh, are three things. First of all, this has been going on for nine months, and um, the district has uh, brought it to the P and Z. 112 people signed up on the website. That does not count the people that filled out the forms. Um, substantial residential uh, resistance to the building and to the, the zoning case. And I was in that meeting, and when we left, the offer was to meet in five months, nothing else. Uh, we were very disappointed in that. And then, and then we see that they've asked to table uh, this, um, uh, this case. So it's been a long time, and I, and I would like to see the thing eventually uh, uh, take a look at the zoning case itself. My concern is the SUP expansion. What is the process unit? Is an equalization tank a process unit? Uh, all the definitions, because I feel like TCEQ and Texas Water Development Board uh, has jurisdiction of a sewage treatment plant site. I don't see that the city has any jurisdiction to control that. Those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. I know I'm going to sound like a broken record. I'm Kathy Alexander. I'm at 2117 Leon Drive. And uh, when you drive into our subdivision or visit the Kroger's, you know that something is dead in the area. And it's really not dead. It's just a treatment plant. But my concern is the building being so close to Los Rios Boulevard. Um, in that building, they're going to put a lab and from the treatment plant, they're going to be bringing samples up into that office building for testing. That's, I just hate the very thought of that. And the fact that we have trucks going in and out of Los Rios Boulevard instead of over on 14th Street, where the uh, garbage delivery housing is, that would be much more conducive excuse me, conducive to our neighborhood. I'd, I'd like for you to consider not tabling this and not approving it. Thank you. Thank you. David Dunshee followed by Tiffany Dunshee. Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you, I'm David Dunshee. I'm at 4021 Hidalgo, Hidalgo Drive in uh, East Plano. Um, we live right across uh, the street from the water treatment facility. Um, I sent some pictures uh, to the city secretary uh, earlier today, a uh, view from my property. I'm, I, I'm afraid I don't, I'm not able to present them. Um, however, uh, there's a clear line of sight issue that the district um, has uh, addressed during the May 7th meeting that we had with them. Um, so th th it was very encouraging, uh, the meeting that we had uh, with them. Um, but we're here as East Plano residents, uh, here to ask for help because we feel vulnerable as residents. We don't feel protected from what goes on at the Water Treatment Center and what we're subjected to as residents in East Plano. Um, the, you know, we have been, my wife and I have been in this uh, house for 24 years, and we have had the exposure of the odor for that long. Um, it's, it is something that comes and goes, and it, it changes with the winds, and it, we can't plan outdoor gatherings. We can't do things. We can't use our property the way we want to. Um, yet we're, we're expected to just give a nod when they want to uh, change the property um, or expand it at a building or whatnot. Um, so we're really asking for uh, better oversight. Um, the SUP gives you the authority 
in, in your ordinance to, to enforce smells, odors, whatnot, if it's enforced. And there is no enforcement mechanism right now. As you mentioned, uh, uh, Councilman, Councilman uh, about that there is no mechanism for the district to be held accountable for new plant, uh, processing units or any footprint ex you know, growth that, at that facility. As residents, we don't know what that looks like. We don't know um, what an expansion looks like. All we know is that the smell could get worse. And we're just, that's why we brought it up with zone. Um, thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Tiffany Dunshi. Thank you for your time. I'm at 4021 Hidalgo Drive with David. Um, I guess my biggest concerns that I would like to focus on are um, the fact that City Council does have some sort of authority right now to enforce an ordinance, the Ordinance 2.403, um, which can impose safeguards against many of the issues we now face whether it's an unpleasant um, visual that you see coming down Los Rios, um, you know, the water treatment center is right after Los Rios Estates. And, you know, I have a fear of the building being the next landmark that you see right when you <laughs> pass the landmark of Los Rios Estates. It's not going to be pleasant. And yes, it can be covered up, hopefully. Um, but my bigger concerns are um, the emissions and the odor, in particular, what's causing the odor, and that there isn't anything in place, to my knowledge, to update or to monitor the emissions if um, something's at an unhealthy level. And I know there are, um, just as there is a move to update this building to make it safer for the employees, I think probably there is technology to also monitor the emissions so that they're kept at a safe level. And you don't ever smell anything. You know, I wouldn't be standing here if I had ever sm hadn't ever smelled anything because there wouldn't be an issue. And I suspect there is a way to cure the emissions problem. Uh, a bigger concern I have is that expanding the SUP would allow the water district to, I guess, um, have the jurisdiction of that land transferred from the city to them and that we would no longer, that you would no longer have a say of what goes on on that land and neither would we. So um, I don't know that there is a solution here. I mean, we can put as many screens up and um, as we want to cover over problems, but I don't know if it's best to approve this at all. I can't see a solution with the way it's presented right now in the zoning case. So thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Shiraz Khan. And then Kim Imel, or Imel, will please follow. Thank you, everyone, for giving me an opportunity to uh, speak today. Um, well, I believe the, the main issue that, that I'm concerned about, and this is not just myself, but um, the same, I, I have 93 neighbors in my community who have signed. It's an online petition, uh, and it also speaks to the same uh, ordinance, uh, I think uh, the one that uh, was just mentioned, 2.403, uh, and specifically uh, with the smell, the odor. Um, I think almost all of the neighbors who have mentioned this, this is within my uh, community alone, uh, is that they are concerned not just about the odor, but how it affects, uh, affects them the, how it affects their children, the quality of life, and as well as the property values in the area. Uh, I moved in this neighborhood about uh, nine years ago. I moved from California, and the first thing that hit me just right around uh, the corner of 14th and Los Rios was that smell. I was living in an apartment in Los, Los Rios Apartments as I moved there before I decided to move into a home. Um, and I was told that is that's perhaps the garbage uh, facility. And I reported it at that time, and I had to report when the smell came in. I, I did that. 
but there was really nothing that followed up after that. As the years went by, that smell was still there and kept coming. And it's the same thing. It's not, you know, really it's coming from the sewage or it's coming from um, the, uh, whether it's coming from the plant itself. I do believe it's coming from the plant because it's the same smell. If you pass through there or you go to my neighborhood, which is about two blocks further down, the smell doesn't change. Uh, what changes is that in, uh, it happens at different times and mostly happens in summer. Um, so I'm, I'm going to end up here. Just, just wanted to say that as my neighbors, uh, you know, as uh, the city has an obligation to enforce this ordinance, and I hope that you do the right thing, I'm asking that we do not table this and make a decision on it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kim Imel from 4020 Hidalgo. We're the closest neighbor to the sewer treatment plant, and we've lived there 35 years. So we have a direct view of the treatment plant. And I was actually encouraged after our meeting with the director and her two cohorts um, because they moved their new building back further and they had plan on having new trees and new berm, and they were really gonna try and work with the neighbors. Um, they just let us know this evening that the trees are out because they're gonna hit wires. So the trees are out, maybe bushes, but um, the smell has been better than it was 35 years ago, but it's not great still. And uh, my concern and the reason I voted no twice when the Zoning Commission sent us notes was because that seven acres needs to be guaranteed not to be expanded on for additional facilities as far as sewer treatment plants. And unfortunately, they bought it anyway. They got it through the zoning. So because they did, and you guys can't guarantee that, the, that in 10 years, and a new regime won't add facilities. And that's my concern. So I'm worried about that. Thank you. The last speaker is Paul McFarland. They said he had to leave, so there are no other speakers. All right. So uh, back to uh, uh, our motion. Does anybody have a motion for me? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Mayor? I have, uh, a few additional questions for the applicant in response to the points raised by the residents, uh, if, if I might ask those. Uh, I'll try to keep it quick. I know it's 9 o'clock, but... Um, Thank you for the opportunity, Mayor, to, to ask these questions, and uh, and thank thank you all for uh, you know in advance for the answers. So, some uh, some very specific and very serious concerns were just raised by the residents who uh, who spoke uh, during the uh, public hearing, and I believe in in working things out and finding common ground. And you know these zoning cases, we've had success with that approach. The Archgate Montessori case comes to mind. Um, that being said, I'm not willing to vote to table just to kick the can down the road. So uh, I want to make sure that there, there really is uh, room to, to work on these issues that the residents have, have raised. Um, so the, uh, the first, uh, there, there was a mention of traffic and obviously ingress, egress is something we frequently look at in, in zoning cases. Um, that, you know, a preference for trucks being on 14th Street, uh, large trucks being on 14th Street rather than Los Rios. 
Uh, is there a way to work on the proposed plan such that trucks would would come through off of 14th Street and cut through uh, to, to this building? Or uh, is, is additional large truck traffic on Los Rios an inevitable consequence of uh, of this zoning request? I'm going to let Mr. Simon answer the, the specific truck question, but the, the very last part of your question, I think, needs to be clarified. There's really not a whole lot about the truck traffic that relates to this zoning request, okay. right? Because all we're doing with the request is the office building. So from an operational truck traffic standpoint, we're not really expecting any changes as a result of the zoning case. But I'll let Mr. Simon tell you the issues with trucks being diverted to 14th Street. Right. So as Brad said, you know, we're not anticipating any additional traffic. We've actually modified the plan. There's two entrances now for the staff to come into the site um, off of Los Rios. Um, the issue with the truck traffic um, is related to the sludge hauling to the landfill. And um, we are looking at options to take it to 14th Street. I will tell you that as the site is <coughs> currently constructed, it is not possible, okay? And the main reason for that is, and this would be something we would have to talk to you about in the operational discussion, there is a very large concrete box, okay? Probably bigger than your rotunda here. And almost all of the sewage coming into the plant goes through that box. So we am working on trying to figure out how we can divert those flows temporarily and then permanently um, so that the flow can continue through the plant and we can make that space available for widening the road. And that is an area that's referred to as the service yard when you see the plan. Um, there's an opening right now that is, I believe, about 16 feet. And I believe for public safety reasons, we would want that road to be about 24 feet. So this is kind of the space we're talking about trying to gain in that general area. There's, of course, another option available where we could approach the adjacent landowner about acquiring their property from them, which would be the um, athletic fields. Gotcha. And for the sake of clarification, because, Mark, the, the box that you're referring to is, is it obstructing our ability to, to, to drive over that area, right? It's in that pinch point. Okay. Right. So thank, thank you for that answer. Then, then uh, just a, a, a few others. Uh, there were, I think, a couple mentions of trees. Uh, and uh, Miss Emil, I believe it was, mentioned that um, trees that, that were being lost, if, if the zoning case were to be approved, uh, had initially been uh, scheduled to, to be replaced, but that's now out because they would hit wires. Uh, I understand if wires would impact the location of trees, but uh, is, is the district committed to replacing trees that are that are uh, cut down? Yeah, so we, we're, we're developing that landscape plan okay. that we'll be providing to okay. the staff. The confusion with um, what Ms. Arnold told you, I think she was reporting to something I said to her this evening, which is she asked me specifically about uh, <clears throat> trees located precisely under some overhead utility lines and i had to clarify mm -hmm. that we can't put trees there for encore reasons okay. but that has no effect or impact on all of the other trees and all the other landscaping outside of the encore easements that we are intending and proposing to install including on, on the berm that's already there to help screen the office building which will already be 18 feet below the berm so there was, I think, a miscommunication there. We're not, we're not removing sure. any trees that were previously promised. Sure. So, so if if we were to vote to table tonight, uh, before we voted on the zoning again, the landscape plan would reflect replacement of trees that are being lost due to any potential rezoning that the council might grant. Correct. I don't, I don't know right off the top of my head exactly how many caliper inches that were being lost that sure. we're adding. I don't know, but we are planting a lot of new okay. landscaping, right. including just, trees. Yeah. Just to clarify. Um, you know, Brad was referring to, if you have a certain line of sight and we have power lines running this way, I can't put the tree directly under the line. Right, right. Yeah. So the strategy is how can we stagger them? But, but based on the original plan that was submitted as an exhibit for the PNZ and the plan that I was working with the landscape architect Friday, we have actually added additional trees to the top of the berm that provide additional height beyond 
the trees that were already there. No trees were removed, and then we added additional screening uh, trees um, near the entrances so that if you're coming north on Los Rios, you won't be able to see diagonally to where the building is located, which is actually below the street level, in case you're not aware, the building is actually um, not visible from the street level. Okay, well, th thank you for that response. <clears throat> and then also, Mr. Linden raised a, a question about what is considered a process unit, and specifically does an equalization tank uh, count as, as a process unit? Uh, obviously, we would you be okay with tightening up, if we were to table this, tightening up the language about process units to make absolutely clear that, that really essentially only 01 office uses would be permitted on, on the, the land on which the SUP was, was expanded to? Yeah, we had a lengthy discussion at the end of our meeting on the 7th about the SUP language, and, and I specifically committed to Mr. Linden that we would share that language with him if he didn't already have it, and if he had any suggestions for how to make it stronger, that he should let us know so that we can work through it. And that was in my correspondence to the neighbors this, this afternoon as well. So absolutely, we want Perfect. to figure out how to do that and, and make sure that we do it in a way that is strong, but also accurate for what we're trying to, what we intend. Fantastic. And, and then uh, finally, uh, if we were to vote to table tonight, um, would the district commit to monthly meetings with the residents? Because, you know, there's been concerns raised about, you know, there was a, and, and, and there may, there, I know, I know based on what y'all are saying, it, it sounds like there, there may not have been a meeting of the minds there, but, um, you know, there was discussion about five months, you know, and then, then maybe that would be after, you know, after we would all already have voted on the, uh, on the request. Uh, would, would the district be willing to commit to monthly meetings during the pendency of the zoning request? I understand that may that may be too frequent in perpetuity, but during the pending of, uh, uh, pendency of the zoning request. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, very very you know, good. Very good. And so we're always available to meet. You know, the, I think it was interesting. We had the meeting at our offices mainly because we don't have a, actually sufficient space at the location to actually meet. Um, there's not actually a meeting <clears> that can hold the number of people we had, which was only 12, right? So... You know, I, I think, you know, our view of it is, is that we're always willing to meet with neighbors that have concerns about the operation. There are things that we don't necessarily perceive because we're inside and not outside. And we understand that they have concerns. We try to address them as, as best we can. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about odor. And I don't discount it. There is a challenge with odor in that, um, the sensitivity of a person to odor versus what our ability is to regularly measure it, right? Um, some people are more sensitive than what we can regularly monitor. And what and there's not a regulatory limit other than for safety reasons. Um, we monitor daily at all the process locations, right? Um, we monitor at the fence line regularly. You know, Jen and I were talking uh, a couple of weeks ago, we took over a thousand samples between when we started this case in November and when we got through the case, through the tabling in, in um, April. And we had nine times where we found at least one of the, the eight odor control control locations we have had a positive uh, number. So that's, you know, less than 1%. And so we know there's still a sensitivity to that. And we're trying to figure out a way that we can take the best available technology we have now, apply whatever else is available. Maybe there's another source that we're not identifying. Um, maybe there's a source outside the facility that we need to go further outside our boundary and look for. Um, but that's kind of the challenge with, with, with addressing that issue. And, and the only other thing is, is we've proposed a change in the treatment process related to how we, we manage our sludge and what that will allow us to do is have um, enclosed processing of the sludge inside of an actual process unit. Instead of having to evacuate the airspace inside the building, it will be a closed system of multiple units. And these are the kinds of things that we try to work through on the engineering basis. But, you know, um, that was one step we took forward. I was talking to Brad and Jenna. Um, last week about we have two locations that use passive odor control. This is very common throughout the distribution system. Plano probably has some of these. Um, it's essentially a carbon canister. 
and you can understand maybe the challenge with those is that they absorb owners for a long time and then they don't. So we go and regularly monitor them. At the site, we may be able to look at alternatives where we can connect some of those passive systems to an active system that's regularly treating the odor um, either through a biological or chemical process. So this is kind of the steps that we trying to go through to identify which location and then which source is, is, is where we might be having some excursions. Well, oh, sorry. I have to say they, thank you very much for that information. I appreciate those answers. And it's very, I mean, it's a little complicated, the science, but you know, when we, if we have the operational discussion, we can show you some of the improvements that we've made recently at the, at the site as part of the current peak flow process. Th thank you again for the information, no, and, and I appreciate the offer. So thank Wait. you. Uh, thank you. I just want to make sure I heard uh, properly what you said a couple of minutes ago. Um, if I understood correctly, um, <clears throat> you're saying that the instruments which you use to measure uh, the odor um, can't really always detect what a person can. Um, it, it, was that accurate? Yeah. So, so as a general rule, field deployment instruments measure around a part per million. Some people have sensitivities below that in the part per billion. Okay, so in the is it eight or nine times, I guess, that you took measurements uh, that it registered a positive result, I guess you said? It, it that registered was, at least one part per billion. Okay, so I guess those must have been on really bad days. Um, if, they, if your instruments were less sensitive than the average human uh, to register that. It could have been at like one location out of eight, right? So yeah. when I say that we had nine positives, that's, you know, if you take a thousand samples, it's, you know, we take okay. on, a, on a given day, right? We sample I think, I think we need to really rein in this operational right. <laughs> conversation. I'm sorry We're always happy to, to keep saying that. We should have it sometime, but. Just want to make the, sure I understood yeah, what was said. With, with the environmental concerns, we have to distinguish between a legal use that is already there and that is having issues operationally, and then some things that can be mitigated through the SUP, like adding a service yard that gives them closer proximity to maybe treat and things like that. So those are two different things, and, and the city manager said he would bring that back to you. I did also want to note, because it was mentioned several times, that the reference that is being used 2.403 um, is an old ordinance, but it's essentially now codified as 6.100.3 in our new ordinance. So I just wanted to get that cleared up for, for the count, because I know y'all take a lot of notes and just to let y'all know too, and we can send them a link to it if we have their email. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one final, uh, I guess, comment and, and question. Said, I, I think as you probably realized that we, we take the, the the safety and comfort of our residents very seriously. Uh, and w with that in mind, Executive Director is here. I, I have a, a question for you. Uh, kind of an old saying is the buck stops here. That's you. So <laughs> what I'd like to ask you is, what's your commitment as the director? To, to be sure that these concerns that the residents have get taken care of, and I know you're you're starting the meetings, and, and that that's a good you know good start. But what what commitment can you tell them that you're willing to do to be sure that these things that they're worried about get get taken care of? So the services that we provide on a daily basis are basic services of water, wastewater, and solid waste, and. We are very proud of the work that we do to protect public health. Uh, the work that we do in this industry has had the biggest impact on protecting public health around this country in the last hundred years as anything. And so that's what we're about is public health. So as, as we talk about safe drinking water and cleaning wastewater to discharge it into our waterways and have safe waterways in our communities, that's something we're really passionate about. And we understand that in the wastewater business, we need to do that while being good neighbors. And that's something that we work really hard to do. Right, and, and, and I'll agree with that. You know, as, as having toured the wetlands you know, project that you have, fabulous. And I, I mean, using old technology, new technology to, to, to do clean water in a, in, a, in a natural fashion. So I know 
you have the capability to, to solve these issues, but you just have to have the commitment and the will to see that it gets done. So, so I'm not Absolutely. doubting your, your capability to do it. Uh, if I just you know wanted you to, to commit to seeing it through that it does get done for the you know for the residents. Yes, absolutely. We are committed to being good neighbors. Uh, we take a, ex, like significant measures to do that on a daily basis, and we are open ears and ready to listen and act to do what's feasible to continue down that roadway. So that is something that we're happy to continue to meet with you all on a monthly basis through the course of the planning and zoning case. Uh, and then we're also willing uh, to meet with you on a more ongoing basis as time goes forward. Uh, so that's something that uh, we are happy to do. Uh, we did meet some of our closer neighbors at the most recent public meeting, or not public meeting, but the one at our office, uh, that we had not previously met. And it was really good to hear from them and hear their experiences and how we can improve that situation at their personal homes. So that's Great. something that we're committed to. There was a question asked earlier, what was the sense of the meeting at the end of it? And I thought it was really positive. Like people actually stood around and visited <laughs> at the end of the meeting. It seemed to me as though it was a very positive meeting and we had identified a number of things that we could do to make their situation better. So I was happy and pleased with the outcome of the meeting and look forward to continuing to work toward being a good neighbor uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Councilman Grady. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think that this discussion has been exceptional. Um, there has been a lot of topics that we have talked about, and I think that it's worth continuing this discussion um, on this topic and making good decisions as we move into the future. Uh, I believe that um, we are probably looking at maybe some less than good decisions that had been made uh, 75 to 100 years ago um, as the city of Plano began to develop from a town to a city and the um, sewage treatment facility, which was three open ponds next to 75 on the west side, um, was moved in 1949, 1950 to its current location. And then decisions were made to sell the farmland um, in between where the city ended, which was two miles west, um, and the sewage treatment plant was two miles east um, to um, build residence on. Um, and I don't know if that was always a, you know, those, those types of decisions are always good from the standpoint that it is a very much like selling land next to an airport and then wondering why everybody doesn't like airplanes. Um, so I think that we need to make good decisions as we move forward on all of these issues, especially with um, the building and other operations of the plant. And therefore, um, I think that we need to have a continued discussion to find the right solutions for everyone concerned. And we won't have that by uh, denying it. So I'm going to make the motion that we table this uh, item and continue the discussion and continue the discussion until we find a solution, then we can bring the item back. What, what date? I'm gonna table it at this point to June 28th with the understanding that we still have, may have discussions to be had. If we still have discussions to be had, I don't think it's a bad idea that we keep moving it out so we get the right solutions. I, so I would like to, if, if it's possible, I don't know whether or not the procedure is correct. I'd like to amend that. I, I don't believe one month out mm -hmm. um, is going to resolve the issues that's currently uh, facing the resident. Um, so I'd like to amend the motion. Uh, and there's, there's a meeting on July 26th and August 9th. What about the end of? Oh, because, you know, you're on a break a little bit in July for some reason. Right. Yeah. So August 6th. August 9th. I'm sorry, August 9th. <clears throat> I'd be amenable to that adjustment and amendment. Okay. And I would second the motion with the amendment. Okay, so we have a motion to table the item until August <clears throat> 9th. I have a motion and a second. You guys amenable to that? Okay. Sure. All right. Please vote. Motion passes six to two. Thank you. Next item. 
Item number two, consideration of RFB number 2021-253B for Collin Creek Culvert Improvements, project number 6804.1 for the Engineering Department to Regal Inc. in the amount of $22,980,671 and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. Good evening. Uh, Caleb Thornhill, Director of Engineering. Just wanted to give you a little bit of background on this project. You've probably heard of it uh, before, but this is the Collin Creek Culvert uh, Rehabilitation or Renovation Project. Uh, the culvert project will be approximately uh, 2,200 feet per barrel, and there's three barrels, uh, so just uh, under 7,000 linear feet of improvement. Uh, the improvement itself will be 14 inches of shot creek or a liner through each of those tunnels. Uh, we anticipate to last about 14 to 16 months. Uh, the culverts are owned and operated or maintained by the city of Plano. Uh, so this is something that we have to do. The culverts were installed uh, in the early 80s. I think it was actually 79 and 80. Uh, and obviously the opportunity with the, uh, the uh, development under construction from an impact standpoint, uh, we felt like this was a, a good opportune time. And obviously with the age of nearing over 40 years, uh, we have been told that the, the, the design engineer indicates that this will be a 50 year life extension of the project. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Councilman uh, actually, never mind. Huh? No. Okay. Any motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve uh, item number two. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you very much. With that being said, there being no further business, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. of Bob Woodruff Park and running under Park Boulevard and along Rowlett Creek, this trail was relocated and rebuilt as a result of erosion along the creek. Running north to south from Legacy Drive to 15th Street, the Chisholm Trail serves as a main artery of Plano's trail system. Designs are underway to create an extension connecting to the former Collin Creek Mall site. The project will extend the existing